morning, distinguished speakers and guests. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Asia Summit on Green Economy. Transition through green infrastructure and investment, co-organized by Arab and Business Environment Council, BEC, sponsored by Invest Hong Kong. I'm Radley, Communications Manager of BEC, and your MC today. It's our great honor to bring together senior government officials, influential industry leaders, investors, service providers from builds, investments, and technology-related sectors to exchange insights and explore green and sustainability-related business opportunities. Without further ado, may I now invite Dr. Andy Lee, East Asia Region Chair of Arab, to give his welcome remarks. Dr. Lee, please. Kevin, Andy, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. It is my pleasure to be here at the Asia Summit on Green Economy with business leaders from across various industries. A very well, warm welcome as well to those joining us online. And thank you to our co-organizer, Business Environment Council, and our sponsor, Invest Hong Kong. We have reached Code Red for Humanity, as evidenced by the increasingly frequent deadly heat waves, intense droughts, floods, and devastating wildfires. Around the world, government have been drawing up action plans seeking to reach the targets set out in the Paris Agreement. In Hong Kong, we also strive to reduce Hong Kong's carbon emission by 50% before 2035 and achieve carbon neutrality before 2050. Along the global momentum, Hong Kong is well positioned to become the go-to hub for green infrastructure financing. Serving the green transformation in the mainland, the region, and in the world. This is an ambitious vision, one that I'm confident Hong Kong can actualize. Why? Well, I could talk about our strategic location at the heart of Asia. I could talk about our world developed and regulated financial infrastructure and a deep pool of professional talents. But today, I would like to highlight our green infrastructure. As one of the most densely built cities in the world, Hong Kong has witnessed the evolution of smart green infrastructure. Increasingly, we see innovative technologies being adopted in new developments including those we have had privilege to take part in, such as the Kowloon East Smart City Development, and most recently, the Solar PV Feasibility Study for the Hong Kong International Airport. Riding on our traditional strength in building construction and unique advantages in smart technologies and sustainability, Hong Kong is positioned to lead the development of green infrastructure in the region. However, for a successful transition to a green economy, we need more than a piece-by-piece, sector-by-sector approach. At Arab, sustainability is at the heart of everything we do. And this includes working in partnership with different stakeholders to forge connections which allow ideas to gain credibility and momentum, creating shared visions and concerted actions to build cities that are not only economically prosperous, but also socially inclusive, environmentally sustainable, and resilient against the challenges of the future. Ladies and gentlemen, three years ago, we were confronted by a crisis, unprecedented and unimaginable for this generation. Today, fortified by the experience of the pandemic and having emerged stronger, we are building for a greener future with optimism and confidence together. To everyone who is here today, thank you for taking part. I hope you find the event enjoyable and insightful. I look forward to the discussions and partnerships. 
that will help us to transition to a greener future together. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Please be seated. Now, I would like to invite Mr. Calvin O'Brien, Chairman of BEC, to deliver his welcome remarks. Mr. O'Brien, please. Andy, Andy, honorable guests, ladies and gentlemen, Zhou San. BEC is excited to co-organize today's Asia Summit on the Green Economy with our fellow member and event partner, Arup. It is my great pleasure to greet you all in person and those joining online. A warm welcome to you all. With a vision to lead, enable, and drive the business community to transform for a green, livable, and sustainable Hong Kong, BC is a pioneer with three decades of success in promoting environmental excellence and galvanizing business action towards a green and sustainable future. We are committed to support and facilitate our members and the wider business sector in accelerating the transition of the city to a green economy and ultimately achieving our net zero objective for the whole community. Today's summit, with transition through green infrastructure and investment as the theme, is going to provide the audience with insights from experts and professionals in the field about investment on green infrastructure, and also the latest technology and development of green technology in Hong Kong and the wider region. As we all know, Hong Kong is positioned as one of the most important regional hubs for promoting green infrastructure and investment. And it has a key role to play in the global green econom economy transition, as well as driving and leading this change in Asia. Taking the journey to the green, econ uh, to, sorry, taking the journey to green our economy is an important step towards achieving our goals of the Paris Agreement. In essence, we look for nations to raise their carbon reduction targets and commitment through more ambitious, nationally determined contributions. We also ask for non-state players, like our business sector, to step up and work together for solutions that would limit average global temperature rise to 1.5 degrees by mid-century. Whilst the transition will lead to huge challenges and risks, it will also bring substantial benefits, such as creating green jobs and business opportunities. As such, what actions we should collectively and individually take to transit to a green economy for the greatest benefits of all, and how we could overcome the challenges involved, deserves our urgent attention and in-depth discussion today, and as already mentioned by Andy. We are honored to have guest speakers and panelists who are experts in their respective industries to share their experience, their ideas, their best practices for contributing to a more sustainable future through promoting green infrastructure and green technology in Asia. I believe all of you will be able to draw inspiration from our experts today and launch or step up your own initiatives that accelerate the green economy transition in your business, in your country, or where your company operates. Whilst we are hosting this event in, in Hong Kong, the learnings today will certainly go beyond boundaries, and we are hopeful that new regional partnerships will be formed as an outcome of today's summit. Last but not least, my heartfelt thanks to our sponsor, Invest Hong Kong, our co-organizer, Arup, and all the speakers, panel chairs, and panelists on this summit today. I hope you will be able to get valuable learning for the event, but most importantly, please don't forget your action when you go back to the office this afternoon. Please enjoy the conference. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. O'Brien. Please be seated. Now, may I invite Mr. Andy Wong, Acting Associate Director General of Invest Hong Kong to deliver his open remarks. Mr. Wong, please.
Dear Andy, Kelvin, um, Councillor General, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. It's my great pleasure to be here to participate in today's event, Asia Summit on Green Economy, co-organized by BEC and also Arab. I'm from in West Hong Kong. Like many cities in Asia, Hong Kong has taken early and also serious action against climate change to strive for sustainable development. Under Hong Kong Climate Action Plan 2050, we are committed to achieve carbon neutrality by 2050. Different measures and large-scale projects are underway. For example, replacing coal-fired generation by natural gas and no carbon source, accelerating the development of district cooling system in new development areas, popularizing electric cars and ferries, promoting hydrogen fueled power bus and heavy vehicles, building waste to energy facility, etc. To achieve carbon neutrality, it involves heavy investment in building green infrastructure with the adoption of advanced green technologies. Our vision is to build or make Hong Kong as a leading global green technology and also financial hub by leveraging our unique competitive advantage such as world-class infrastructure, R&D facilities, academic excellence, international financial center status. In addition, Hong Kong government has implemented various policy to support the green infrastructure. For example, allocating 350 million to subsidize ferry operator to construct and test electric ferries. Setting up 400 million Hong Kong dollar green tech fund to support research and development projects, helping Hong Kong to decarbonize and enhance environmental protections. Establish the government green bond programs to fund green-related infrastructure projects, including the issuance of 100 million tokenized green bond in, for retail subscription, setting up the green and sustainable financial grant scheme, etc. The proposed Northern Metropolis and the Nantau Tomorrow Vision Development Plan will definitely provide tremendous business opportunity for Hong Kong. The fast-paced urbanization in Asia-Pacific definitely call for greater degree of innovation technology adoption and investment in green infrastructure, therefore opening up various or tremendous opportunities to construct large-scale projects for low carbon infrastructure to facilitate sustain, sustainable urban development. Hong Kong can provide significant opportunity in this green economy by capitalizing on the business opportunity brought by Guangdong, Hong Kong, Macau, Greater Bay Area, and the Belt and Road Initiative, in which Southeast Asia market are the hotspot for the Belt and Road Initiative projects. We invest Hong Kong welcome more enterprise to make use of Hong Kong capital market, technology advancement, as well as our world-class financial and professional service to capture the green economy opportunities. I wish you all enjoy today's event. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wong. Please be seated. It's our great honor to have Mr. Christopher Hu, Secretary for Financial Services and the Treasury, to give us a keynote speech today. Although Mr. Hu cannot join us in person today, he has recorded a video to set the scenes for today's discussion. Let's watch the video now. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. It is my great pleasure to speak with you at the Asia Summit on Green Economy hosted by our UMass Hong Kong Business Environment Council and Arab today. I would like to take the opportunity to share with you the role of Hong Kong as the leading green financial hub connecting the mainland and global markets. We are all aware that promoting green economy for sustainable development is a subject of global concern. In the 14 five-year plan, the Central People's Government has outlined its goals to promote comprehensive green transformation of economic and social growth and its effort to reach the 
carbon dioxide emissions peak by the year 2030 and achieve carbon neutrality before 2060. Back in Hong Kong, our goals are to attain a 50% reduction in carbon emissions by the year 2035 and carbon neutrality by 2050. To attain our goals and accelerate the development of Hong Kong into an international center for green tech and finance, the financial secretary announced in his 2023-2024 budget that the government will proceed in five directions namely, first of all, building a green tech ecosystem, secondly, green finance application and innovation, thirdly, green certification and alignment with international standards, fourthly, training for talents, and finally, and certainly not the least, enhancing the exchange in collaboration with the Guangdong, Hong Kong, Macau, Greater Bay Area, and international markets. Hong Kong, a vibrant and resilient international financial center, is uniquely positioned to play a leading role in green finance. Over the years, with local, mainland, and overseas issues, using our sustainable finance platform, the amount of green and sustainable debt arranged and issued in Hong Kong has been increasing steadily. The total green and sustainable debt, including both bonds and loans issued in Hong Kong, increased by over 40% from the year 2021 to reach over 80 billion US dollars in the year 2022, among which the volume of green and sustainable bonds arranged in Hong Kong accounted for one third of the Asian market. Since the year 2019, we have successfully issued government green bonds under the government green bond program, totaling close to 16 billion US dollars equivalent. This includes the largest ESG bond issuance in Asia, totaling 5.75 billion US dollars equivalent we issued back in January this year, and the world's first government tokenized green bond totaling 800 million Hong Kong dollars in February this year. These issuances set an important new benchmark for potential issuers in Hong Kong and the region, and enriched the green and sustainable finance ecosystem. To promote the adoption of green financing by enterprises, as of end March this year, grants have been approved for over 220 related debt instruments issued in Hong Kong since the launch of the Green and Sustainable Finance Grant Scheme in the year 2021, involving a total underlying debt issuance of over 560 billion Hong Kong dollars. Furthermore, the launch of Core Climate by the Hong Kong Stock Exchange last October to trade international voluntary carbon credits signifies a critical step forward in our development of carbon marketplace in Hong Kong. Following the publication of the Common Ground Taxonomy Report by the International Platform on Sustainable Finance, our Green and Sustainable Finance Cross Agency Steering Group will, with the aim of aligning with the Common Ground Taxonomy, work towards proposing the structure and core elements of the local green classification framework for consultation, which shall facilitate EC navigation among the Common Ground Taxonomy, the Mainland's Taxonomy, and the EU's Taxonomy. Last month, the Hong Kong Stock Exchange also published a consultation paper to seek market feedback on proposals to enhance climate-related disclosures under the ESG framework, which proposed to mandate all issuers to make climate-related disclosures in their ESG reports and introduce new climate-related disclosures aligned with the International Sustainability Standards Board, acknowledging the readiness of the issues and their concerns. HAEX proposed interim provisions for certain disclosures for the first two reporting years following the effective date next year on the 1st of January. To drive innovation and expertise in green and sustainable finance, we invest in capacity building and education. The government launched in December 2022 a three-year pilot green and sustainable finance capacity building support scheme with a total provision of 200 million Hong Kong dollars for application by market practitioners and related professionals 
as well as students and graduates of relevant disciplines. After completing eligible programs or accomplishing relevant qualifications, applicants can apply for a subsidy of up to 10,000 Hong Kong dollars. Ladies and gentlemen, the government will continue to accelerate the development of Hong Kong into an international center for green and sustainable finance, contributing to the attainment of 3060 dual carbon targets of our country and promoting green transformation of our economy. We will work closely with industry and relevant stakeholders to achieve our goal, and of course, including all of you. As announced in the 2023 to 24 budget, the Financial Secretary will set up a Green Tech and Finance Development Committee, inviting industry representatives to assist in the formulation of an action agenda. I invite you all to join us on this journey as we strive to create a greener and brighter world for our next generations. I wish you all a rewarding forum today. Thank you. The first plenary session of today's conference is titled Investment on Green Infrastructure. I would like to invite the panel chair, Ms. Jenny Lee, Under Secretary General of Hong Kong Green Finance Association to stage to kick off the session. Ms. Lee, please. Um, good morning, uh, distinguished uh, guests and uh, speakers. First, I would like to thank um, Arab and BC for co-organizing this very timely event and also Invest Hong Kong um, as a sponsor. Um, as HKGFA, we're very um, honored to be a strategic partner for this event. Um, tackling the climate crisis really requires um, a significant investment in green and sustainable infrastructure and at an unprecedented speed um, and scale. And the, then this investment is actually very um, significant because it's estimated that $90 trillion um, dollars is required globally between now and 2030 to meet the Paris um, Agreement, um, of which Asia will need $1.7 trillion dollars annually to maintain its economic growth, uh, tackle poverty, and mitigate climate risk. Um, from what we've heard from um, the speeches today, there is um, clear alignment and clear um, drive and support from the government um, to uh, uh, transition um, the economy um, to uh, a sustainable green infrastructure. But I think what we need more of is also the collaboration between not just the public capital, but also the private capital, between asset owners um, and policy makers. And in order to uh, make this transition uh, successful, we also need to work together as public sector funds um, is not sufficient um, to really um, achieve um, the climate goals. So what do we need um, to um, do to attract investors um, to this? I think we need to have a very visible pipeline um, of infrastructure opportunities that align with internationally accepted definitions of green, sustainable, um, and infrastructure. And one of the things that Hong Kong is doing is looking at aligning to a common ground taxonomy, which will enable the cross-referencing of um, infrastructure or, or activities between um, China and EU. So today's panel will bring together um, experts from across the ecosystem to really look in depth into the opportunities in transitioning to low carbon technologies and assets in the region with a focus on Hong Kong and the Greater Bay Area. And they'll also look at the discussion around the potential for public and private uh, partnerships in terms of funding these um, large scale infrastructures. And then the challenges of balancing um, environmental and financial considerations. So as we consider these issues, um, we must also recognize um, the importance of collaboration and cooperation. No single sector or stakeholder can tackle climate change alone. We need a collective effort between government, businesses, and civil society, and which is why we are here today. So before we start the panel discussion, I'd like to invite um, each of the panelists to give a short presentation on where they see the opportunities in greening Asia's economy. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lee. It's now my pleasure to introduce the first speakers of this session, Dr. Vincent Zhang, Director of Climate and Sustainability Services, 
East Asia of Arab. Dr. Zhang, please. Good, good morning, everyone, uh, and uh, again, a uh, warm welcome to all of you to join this event. Uh, I would like to take this uh, opportunity to uh, present uh, some of the uh, findings of our recent study uh, globally on this uh, green economy. In particular, we focus on uh, Asia. Uh, in the study, actually, we look into these three uh, key uh, issues uh, which help to shape or define uh, what means by you know, green economies. First is on the definitions. What actually you know, uh, green economy entail, and, and importantly, what the scale or size of that uh, could be. And uh, finally, definitely, that we need to uh, find the kind of mechanism to help us to capture uh, these, uh, these opportunities. So firstly, on the definitions, we know that we need to have, uh, you know, start with objective first. And globally, that it's well defined uh, that we need to look into environmental, uh, the economics, and social uh, aspects in order to achieve uh, that uh, uh, at the end. And I think, um, in particular, environmental, that uh, throughout this uh, new transition, so that our objective is very clear that we like to uh, uh, get to the kind of a neutralized society uh, in the next uh, three or so kind of uh, decade. Uh, that, of course, we create a lot of benefits in economics, including more. Uh, high quality jobs and also other social benefits on achieving the SE, uh, UN SDGs kind of objective. So uh, the team actually work uh, uh, with uh, specialists and also experts in this area. So we come up with some what we call primary aims on environmental uh, aspect, including you know uh, how to uh, cut and uh, capture uh, emissions and how we can uh, again importantly uh, adapt to climate change and the e economics uh, size we also like to see more growth growth is very important and also create kind of jobs uh, and enhance the competitive uh, advantages and uh, across uh, this uh, few competitions in, in, in trade and socially that we like to achieve uh, some uh, issues that have been raised uh, in the UN SDG uh, earlier speakers have touched on this, uh, you know, taxonomy. That it's very important. So without, you know, right certification, it's difficult you know, for uh, the business uh, investment in particular, and also um, policymakers to work uh, along with. Uh, we know that uh, globally, uh, the and also within, in particular, in the financial sector, we have come up with very established uh, the uh, taxonomy uh, that tell you what actually. Uh, is the kind of key or important, you know, green activities that we should be you know, backing on. But uh, that's, that's a speaker also raised that uh, there's some uh, in, uh, consistency and importantly on uh, the details on how this is going to be you know, taken on board. So um, that's why there's um, uh, kind of harmonizations of work being in place worldwide, including the, the one between EU and also China and also uh, on that ISB exercise. That actually helped uh, to uh, develop a kind of consistent framework for us to work on. But there's some missing things, is that uh, you know, these are more uh, kind of compliance-based uh, uh, kind of reporting. So in order to uh, trigger uh, more discussions or instigate kind of change uh, wider in our society, we need to uh, think broader. So the team actually come up with um, uh, these kind of frameworks uh, which define what's the uh, sectors uh, which we found uh, should be more active in the coming years, you know, including uh, uh, foods, uh, manufacturing, transport, uh, constructions, uh, power, and so on and so forth. So under these, we also need to uh, develop the details of green activities that actually can create and generate uh, more uh, kind of opportunities uh, to help the growth of our economies. So um, be uh, Beyond that, uh, we need to uh, look into the possibilities on the technologies and importantly uh, on the institutional arrangement and regulatory frameworks uh, that can help uh, create even more kind of opportunities on that. So we've come up with this uh, very long list uh, of you know, activities which I think should form uh, the base uh, for the industry uh, players, including governments and also uh, the business sector to work on in order to uh, create a kind of consensus uh, for uh, particular economies to develop uh, their strategies. Um, so it's actually um, come up with more than 500, 500 uh, kind of sub activities uh, which we think is important and in inducive for uh, the policymakers to work on. 
Now come to the uh, quantifications uh, things that uh, we had uh, been discussed a lot you know, on this uh, green economy. So hardly have, have we actually come uh, to, uh, num to the numbers uh, that how big or how extensive that can go. Uh, we know uh, uh, based on uh, data that I mean, uh, the year before 2021, so the, the kind of cost or the loss on the weather related uh, in the interruptions is, uh, can reach size and you uh, 360 uh, billions a year. That's actually a lot. If you can do something you know, to avoid that loss, and more importantly, to enhance and create more opportunities on, on during the process of this transformation, that actually is the kind of uh, directions we should travel, uh, work together uh, in order to arrive at the solution on that. Uh, we have uh, discussed, you know, in general, what's actually formed the kind of opportunities. So I think these are the kind of the pillars I think we should uh, work on. Uh, in, in, in order to uh, allow us to capitalize the benefit of this uh, green economy, in particular on uh, the competitive thing opportunities that we should uh, work more on how we could uh, uh, help the industry you know, to uh, reduce the kind of disruptions uh, on that. And secondly, also importantly, and on the uh, green, uh, new green markets, uh, we know uh, solar, wind, uh, uh, catching up very fast, but beyond solo and wind, what else can we do? And then that must be a lot of works uh, that can help to push the economy uh, further. And uh, thirdly, is so not the least, it's uh, productivity gains. That, I think, is important. So we know that the um, climate change actually have uh, created kind of disruptions. And uh, by the way, mitigating that actually can help us to improve, enhance our you know, efficiency uh, along that. So I think uh, the, the, the table on the right actually shows uh, more details on how we can address uh, these issues across the nine critical sectors uh, that have been discussed. Uh, in terms of scales, that uh, somebody actually earlier had uh, the speaker said, uh, suggest uh, some numbers. And here's uh, what uh, we estimate. Uh, uh, we know that before uh, 2050s, uh, we will need to uh, uh, mass uh, kind of uh, you know, capitals at the um, scale of you know, 90, uh, 70 trillions. So that's actually a lot, a lot of mon uh, money as at currently, and at the global uh, GDP is talking about uh, 100 uh, trillion. So I think 70 trillions is actually a huge amount of money. And uh, in particular, uh, we estimate that uh, the um, kind of a, um, new uh, green goods and services that uh, can be created uh, is among or over you know ten uh, trillions uh, to the year twenty fifties. So they actually uh, account for more than three percent, three percent of our global uh, GDP uh, by then. So that comes uh, shown on the uh, right. Actually, is so the kind of uh, uh, our you know projection and predictions uh, kind of opportunities across that uh, you know, critical or uh, important areas uh, that will build up uh, in the next uh, two or three you know decades. Some are actually direct values, some uh, indirects that generate uh, due to, for example, create more jobs on that. So um, why now we talk about these issues? So we know uh, that we are uh, in the kind of uh, new uh, chapters after this uh, kind of a post cold uh, words kind of economy. We need a green recovery. That's uh, very important for everyone's for growth. And then uh, we know that globally, uh, there's agreements that uh, we need to uh, penalize uh, those you know, dirty industry, and importantly, that uh, we found that uh, the, um, the the technologies and also the means to uh, arriving you know, the um, uh, decarbonization is getting and more and more uh, cheaper and more and more viable. And uh, because last uh, not least, uh, we uh, have seen uh, some new actually some new business have been created already, including you know, carbon trading. Uh, what's suggested by uh, our secretary, and also the uh, green finance is becoming uh, more and more important uh, in the industry. So we have to uh, devise uh, the kind of a strategy for us to implement that. Uh, we think that we need to prioritize efforts. That's um, uh, definitely important, and we need to take a structural uh, kind of action on that. But in particular, on that uh, action, we have identified those nine areas which are things uh, important uh, for all the stakeholders, including uh, the uh, governments. Uh, we think that uh, you know, uh, governance, uh, policy, uh, standard, and regulations are important. Uh, that is to be, you know, of course, uh, addressed uh, by our, the leadership of our governments. Uh, they need to formulate 
the regulatory, uh, legal, uh, institutional, and, and financing uh, frameworks, uh, which will enable us to uh, create more you know, bankable uh, projects. But also importantly, that we need a kind of attraction you know, also you know, from uh, the private sector. Uh, issues like uh, you know, innovations, uh, finance, and capacity buildings, uh, infrastructure in particular, and also the markets are what the private sector are good at. First, uh, plan ahead, uh, the business uh, need to know the size on right, exact on the particular you know, um, sector, in particular in, in con, uh, the uh, infrastructure sectors that uh, uh, ADB actually have worked out some numbers uh, based on the projections, uh, the current kind of uh, development and also projections uh, for the future demand. So the uh, industry actually can plan uh, work against uh, those numbers and plan the kind of required resources uh, to capture that. But, uh, we can also do from uh, bottom end, uh, like uh, what uh, the, um, we are now working in Singapore, that uh, we can uh, start from, for example, the regulation changes and also uh, other you know, changes in the fuel mix and so on and so forth. That actually can create and other uh, areas uh, which we haven't you know, been uh, tried or tested before. And from there, actually, we can calculate the sort of a new and green kind of a business that can generate uh, domestically, and importantly, how uh, that actually can boost uh, the kind of exports, uh, in particular in this region. Kind of economic structure is very, very important on that. So these are the details that, uh, if interest, I can uh, give you more uh, later on. Uh, lastly, for uh, also very importantly uh, about projects, we need projects to work on. So I think. Uh, Firstly, we have to uh, find the right positioning that uh, our secretary actually have uh, pointed out the strategic um, advantages of, uh, of um, uh, GBA and that definitely that we should work more uh, in collaboration with uh, the other you know, jurisdictions across the border. And here in Hong Kong, we need, of course, address our own uh, kind of bottleneck on infrastructures. I think uh, the source of capital and importantly, and how uh, we can have uh, enough you know, people and also the uh, expertise to handle uh, your mega and big project is a kind of uh, issues that we have to address. So uh, all in all, we need uh, to um, create uh, you know, more um, bankable, bankable, you know, workable projects uh, in the pipelines so that we can work uh, together. So that's uh, my uh, final conclusion, so basically three points. Uh, that uh, we think we need a new definitions on the taxonomy and the beyond uh, simply for uh, you know, the um, reportings and also compliance. Uh, secondly, that we know uh, the opportunity is huge, but we need to be specific you know, in, in particular in Hong Kong and also for uh, the quick debate areas, what are the kind of strategic locations we can are on. Last, not, not the least, that we need to act you know, together uh, to get the uh, implementation uh, framework uh, be uh, ready for everyone to work on. So that's uh, my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Zhang. Please be seated. Up next, may I invite Mr. Loman Jang, Business Development and Performance Director of Veolia Hong Kong on stage. Mr. Jang, please. Thank you. Uh, I am, excuse me, uh, I'm honored uh, to be invited as uh, one of the panelists uh, for this exciting event. Um, I think uh, the awareness for environmental management has increased exponentially over the past decade as uh, climate, the impact of climate change has been very apparent. Uh, different countries, uh, our country itself, uh, is looking to uh, reach carbon neutrality by 2060, while Hong Kong is aiming to reduce or to reach uh, carbon neutrality by 2050. Um, other countries like Japan or South Korea are aiming to reduce uh, their carbon emission by 40% or even 50% by 2030. So a lot of countries are implementing different measures in order to curb down their carbon emission to save the world. 
Obviously, Hong Kong has developed many plans uh, in order to tackle this challenge. Uh, one of the statistics uh, given by the Hong Kong government is that 60% of the uh, carbon emission or the greenhouse gas emission is actually attributed to uh, power distribution or power generation, whereas 20% come from transport, while 8 to 9% is from waste management, actually. And so there are rooms to improve on this regard. And what are the decarbonization strategies for Hong Kong? And these are the four areas that we are looking into at the moment. Uh, as some of the previous speakers mentioned, uh, the fuel mix is now uh, being altered at the moment. Uh, the two power companies used it to have uh, use coal as its primary source of fuel. And now they are reducing that and use a little bit more of natural gas and maybe even importing more uh, nuclear power into the mix. In addition, the government is providing more renewable energy plan or energy strategies. For example, the feed-in tariff uh, with the two power companies, uh, the different um, uh, construction and implementation of renewable energy plants, which I'll mention a little bit later, and also uh, the introduction of hydrogen into the mix. Uh, especially uh, for transport, uh, on the transport side as well. I think, as mentioned by a previous speaker, hydrogen could be a source of, uh, of fuel in the future, especially for mass uh, uh, public transport. And not only that, uh, there is a plan to reduce the energy consumption by, uh, in, the, in the residential or commercial uh, sector by uh, 35 to 40 percent by 2035. So energy performance has become a very critical issue uh, for the, uh, in our decarbonization strategy. Uh, not only that, for green fuel projects, uh, district cooling has become a very prominent uh, technology to be employed. Uh, Kitec has already been uh, using this district cooling system. For uh, there are a few other projects coming up in Hong Kong. Uh, namely Tong Chong Hong Sui Q, uh, which will employ uh, district cooling as well. And of course, in terms of, as I mentioned, waste management actually contributes to 8% of the total carbon emission of Hong Kong. How that could be changed? Because right now, Hong Kong is relying mainly on landfills is, as its final means of disposal. Um, landfills actually acts as a very large anaerobic digester and so the organic components are being degraded by bacteria in which it can be converted into methane. If it's not captured properly, then it could be released into the atmosphere where the uh, impact would be much worse, 26 to 28 times worse than carbon dioxide alone. Even if we were to build any um, uh, um, incineration facilities, you are still emitting carbon dioxide as a source unless you have carbon capture technologies installed uh, at the facilities. So there are a lot of room to improve in terms of waste uh, management. And one of the uh, primary uh, initiative by the government is to reduce the amount of waste that would be produced in Hong Kong. As uh, some of the previous uh, speakers mentioned, ESG has become a very important element in the private companies as well. And we often talk about scope one and scope two, which is the direct emissions and the, the indirect emissions. But now we have also moved on to uh, scope three as well. Uh, Actually, uh, I think in some of the companies, we are looking into scope four, which is the avoid and the reduce emissions as well. And that will be coming uh, further down the line. And this ESG gives an incentives for the companies to perform better in terms of the environmental, social, and governance aspects so that their uh, funding could come in a cheaper perspective. And going back a little bit to the environmental uh, side of things, in terms of solid waste management, uh, this is something that could be drastically improved in Hong Kong. In 2011, we are looking at 1.27 kilograms per capita per day in terms of waste generation. And the plan was that it would be reduced to 0 0.8 by 2022. 
but look at the latest figures. It has not only re it hasn't reduced, but it has increased instead to 1.53 kilograms per capita per day. Hong Kong in this region has one of the highest uh, generation rate in this region of the world. Uh, per day, we are producing 1,500 tons of waste, which are going to the landfill, of which 11,000 tons are actually municipal solid waste in nature. And so there are a lot of uh, room in terms of improvement. Uh, in terms of the waste management strategies in Hong Kong, as I mentioned, we are relying mainly on three landfills for disposal at the moment. Uh, there is uh, Nen, Wen, and Sen. Sen is only taking on the um, uh, construction waste at the moment, so that leaves two landfills, Nen and Wen. Obviously, the Hong Kong government is trying to re introduce more renewable energy projects. That includes uh, organic waste, part, O Park 1, O Park 2, uh, I Park 1 as well, which would be able to handle approximately 3,000 tons of municipal solid waste. And in the pipe work, there is also uh, uh, I Park 2, which should be able to increase the municipal solid waste to 4,000. Uh, that, that plan would be able to handle 4,000 tons per day. And I Park 3 as well, which would be in the range of 4,000 tons per day as well. But in general, um, this is the uh, waste blueprint that is incorporated into the Hong Kong uh, 2035 waste blueprint. Uh, one of the key is to reduce the amount of waste that's being produced in Hong Kong. The problem is uh, there has been talk about the implementation of the waste charging scheme for years. And now I think the government has uh, actually uh, run, is running a pilot and hopefully by the end of the year this can actually be implemented and not only be talking about it. And in that sense we could actually reduce the amount of waste produced. The problem is uh, uh, not only in terms of the amount of waste produced, segregation is also an issue. Right now we are talking about O Park 1 and O Park 2 which should be able to uh, handle a combined organic waste uh, total of 500 tons. The problem is comes from the collection side, whether waste could be segregated properly and whether that could be collected properly and delivered to the plant. That's still a question to be asked. And so recycling is actually something that could be further looked into because it's not done very well in Hong Kong as well uh, for several issues. One, land is a premium in Hong Kong, so that becomes very expensive. Operating costs is also very expensive as well. So to, for a private company uh, to venture into this particular business becomes difficult if uh, we cannot come up with a, a feasible, financially feasible case. And so right now, a lot of these initiatives are actually subsidized by the government, and this needs to be changed. Uh, in the future as well. And just looking into some of the technologies in Hong Kong, uh, Tea Park is uh, what, the largest uh, sludge incineration plant which employs fluidized bed as its core technology. Uh, it's very specialized in this uh, particular plant. It's uh, actually a flagship plant in Hong Kong because it's not connected to any of the grids. Uh, it uh, extracts water from the sea uh, so that it produces um, drip potable water and also processed water for the plant. The wastewater is treated to uh, waste um, a recycling standards so that it could be reused for potable, uh, for uh, um, toilet flushing and also for irrigation purposes. Excess electric electricity is actually utilized on site and uh, excess would be imported into the, exported into the grid as well. Uh, o Park One uh, also uh, another way uh, another way of increasing the renewable energy mix in Hong Kong because the food waste actually goes under anaerobic digestion where electricity could be produced as a result. Compost compost are actually uh, uh, is actually a byproduct for this particular plant as well. And uh, district cooling system I think some of the speakers have already mentioned so. Uh, 
Uh, I'm not going too much into this. Uh, landfill, as I mentioned, gas would be actually produced from the landfill, and what it could be used for electricity, uh, for weight leachate treatment uh, uh, systems, and also for deliver to town gas or CLP for uh, production. Actually, I think it could also be converted into hydrogen, green, a source of green hydrogen as well. And so these are opportunities that exist for this particular system. And Greater Bay Area Development. Obviously, we've talked about, I think some of the previous speakers also mentioned about this. Uh, on the western uh, side, that's more of the economic uh, corridor. On the eastern side, that's the technology and, uh, and knowledge hub that we are talking about. And two major projects uh, that's actually uh, critical to the development of the Greater Bay Area, especially for Hong Kong. Uh, one is Lantau Tomorrow, the other one is the Northern Metropolis. And you know, in terms of uh, North, uh, 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 Lantau Tomorrow, we're talking about a thousand hectares of land which needs to be reclaimed. And the estimation is approximately $580 billion in terms of investment. On the other hand, the northern metropolis, we are talking about 30,000 hectares of land. And we are talking about multi-trillion dollars of investment. Can the government handle the same project at the same time? Which the government right now, because uh, they are quite rich at the moment, so very often they are the ones that are investing in the projects at the same time. Uh, could public-private partnership be a, an, an approach uh, uh, for these two particular projects? This is something that we can ponder upon. And that's the end of my presentation. Sorry, ran, overran a little bit. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Zhang. Please be seated. Now, may I invite Ms. Carmen Zhang, Executive Director, Head of Sustainable Investment Banking, Greater China of Credit Agricole, <coughs> excuse me, Credit Agricole CIB on stage. Ms. Sun, please. Hello. Good morning, everyone. Um, pleasure to be here. Credit Agricole uh, takes very uh, much pride in ourselves being a green bank, and uh, we're also very honored to be uh, the Hong Kong government's uh, joint structuring bank uh, since 2019 for its international green bond program. So today I'd like to uh, uh, contribute a bit to our panel uh, from the perspective of uh, the international sustainable finance market. Um, so first of all, to put things into context, I want to uh, uh, highlight the enormous investment uh, gap and needs uh, for us to reach 2050 net zero goal. Uh, on your uh, right hand side, you see depending on different studies and uh, I think uh, Vincent also had uh, mentioned earlier uh, uh, with, his, uh, with the number, uh, the annual investment need is enormous, uh, range from three uh, trillion to eight trillion dollar uh, annually until 2050, depending on the you know the data provider projection model. Uh, according to one study, uh, it, it represents around uh, three to six percent of the world's uh, uh, GDP, um, and so we know that uh, the uh, uh, investment gap is uh, enormous. Um, at the same time, uh, on the right hand side, focusing on a certain uh, uh, aspect like the uh, sustainable energy transition. Um, we see that this investment gap is not really equally distributed. So like uh, here we see uh, China, for example, is in a much better position compared to regions like India uh, and, um, and the Middle East when it comes to uh, uh, a sustainable energy transition. And the uh, looking back in the 2022, our past performance uh, in, in the market, we channeled around 632 billion of climate funding um, and uh, split between uh, 50-50 between uh, public and private sector, and that represent around 16% of the uh, climate finance needs globally. Um, and this figure could be uh, much smaller uh, if you, you use the uh, higher end of the investment need uh, according to different projection model. So um, another uh, key point I want to highlight is uh, the global uh, financial market so far, uh, when it comes to green bonds or you know, green loan, we've really focused on climate change adaptation uh, 
climate change mitigation and decarbonization. So when it comes to strengthening and, and um, making sure there's climate resilient and climate adaptation aspect for our asset, for our infrastructure, this, uh, for, for, for this aspect, the financing gap is even higher. So there's a study saying you know, around 90% of the, there's a 90% investment shortfall in financing um, the adaptation and resilient aspect for, for our assets. So green is definitely not just about decarbonization, a very important part, but also you know, adaptation, resilient, and also uh, biodiversity, nature, um, uh, the overall nature impact. And um, to give you a review of how uh, the market is currently doing, um, so if we focus on the uh, global sustainable uh, bonds and loan market, uh, back in 2021, it already surpassed to be a trillion dollar market. Uh, last year, uh, we had a little bit of downfall because uh, the overall market condition uh, was not so good. But if we look at the um, ESG labeled bond uh, as a, a percentage of the total bond issuance globally, we see that this ratio has been increasing year on year. And uh, one thing to note that uh, I'll, I'll talk about a little bit later on is that in the ESG uh, um, structuring world, there's different uh, structuring approach. And at the moment, the most mainstream structuring approach maintained to be the dedicated use of proceed approach. Uh, around 90% of the green bond, uh, of, the, of the global uh, sustainable label bond market maintains to uh, uh, use this uh, structuring approach. And we are very supportive, very optimistic about the continuous growth of this market. Um, and of course, on one hand, we have uh, regulators uh, like the Hong Kong government, Hong Kong MASFC, uh, are really uh, promoting uh, uh, the market through incentives uh, and guidelines, uh, clearer frameworks. On the other hand, if we look at the demand side uh, from lenders and investors, um, uh, as a market, we are really realizing the financial materiality of ESG factors. And so more and more uh, investors are focusing on ESG. There's no uh, one single you know, official definition uh, of ESG investment, and therefore uh, we can only use proxies to uh, size the, size the market, uh, market size. So uh, one of the main uh, or most commonly used uh, pro a proxy is the uh, UMPRI. Uh, so the AUM under uh, uh, signatory of the uh, UMPRI um, is uh, really growing year on year. It's a, uh, 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 hundreds of uh, trillions of dollars. Um, and as you see here, really is surpassing, you know, ground break, uh, have, um, have a, a breakthrough every year. Uh, even during you know market downturn, and um, when we look at the global uh, sustainable uh, investment assets, um, is mainly still uh, on the bottom, uh, mainly driven by the U.S. Uh, and the European investors. Although in APAC we are really catching up. Um, and we, again, very optimistic about the, the continuous growth uh, and support from our investor in this market uh, because more banks, uh, more investors are, are now really signing up uh, to make their net zero commitment with the establishment of net, uh, this, uh, uh, alliances such as the Net Zero Banking Alliance, Net Zero um, uh, Asset Management, and Asset Owner uh, uh, Alliance. And another trend I would like to highlight is the uh, more diverse uh, uh, structures, ESG structures, uh, and the application in financial product. So the uh, market right now still is primarily driven by bond and loan as a products, uh, but uh, as uh, in credit or call, we're really pioneers in, in, this, uh, in this space, and we are uh, really trying uh, our best to integrate the ESG and the green element uh, across different financial uh, solutions that we offer to our clients, like uh, green guarantee, sustainability link, uh, supply chain financing, uh, green ripple, uh, sustainability link derivatives. Um, so uh, these are, uh, and, and also you, uh, on the other hand, you have different, uh, sus uh, different labels in the market like blue, uh, blue bond, you probably heard of SDG bond, emission linked uh, uh, transactions. So with the rise of all this uh, different structuring approach, different labels, I think um, for uh, regulators, for investors uh, and corporate as well, we are more um, aware of the greenwashing risk and it's important to uh, keep in mind, you know, uh, these uh, um, uh, with the wide, uh, uh, this development of the structuring approach, um, it's important to, uh, yeah, to, to uh, not to 
invent new label just to uh, for for inventing sake it's important to you know make sure uh, the, the reason that we're launching these new labels are to uh, really encourage our, uh, our clients our uh, corporates to improve their sustainability performance and hopefully to link their ESG performance to their financing cost and um, a few summary of um, the uh, latest uh, uh, trends here in the, in the market and how it may translate into some implication for green infrastructure. The first one is, uh, uh, again, uh, green, uh, when it comes to the definition, uh, taxonomy, uh, we're very clear now in the international market, but uh, we're getting more sophisticated in understanding green. Green is not just about, you know, uh, if it's new renewable energy, it is green. Uh, we need to also look at the, uh, uh, for emission, look at the life cycle perspective, um, and again, uh, the climate adaptation, resilient aspect of the asset. And uh, also with the uh, launch of the TNFD, now we're also uh, exploring and encouraging company to, uh, to, to focus more on the nature-related aspect, biodiversity related aspect of the infrastructure project. Um, so in uh, referencing the EU uh, taxonomy perspective, projects should be green and sustainable, uh, not uh, just that because it is meeting at least one of the environmental uh, objectives like climate change adaptation. It also should do no significant harm to any other important environmental objectives such as biodiversity. Um, and uh, another uh, important uh, trend in the market is investors and financial institution. Now when we are, are looking at green transaction, we're looking beyond the label. Um, so now in the, in the market, we have very clear you know, green bond principle, social bond principle, but investors now are, are looking at the, uh, also the corporate, uh, on the corporate level, what is the, the issuer or the corporate doing to transition, especially for uh, uh, corporates in the um, high uh, carbon intensity sector. Um, and, and that is uh, really supported and uh, evident by the increasing use of ESG rating uh, in the market. Um, and also reinforced by uh, the um, rising, uh, the rise of, uh, or the more increasing use of uh, different uh, structures, such as a sustainability link structure, transition finance structure, uh, beyond the use of uh, the more traditional used green use of proceeds structure. And so our, our recommendation is for corporate to, uh, who, who are interested in tap this market to not just look at the transaction label, but also uh, be aware of uh, the benchmarking uh, of your uh, corporate level ESG performance. And the final trend is uh, definitely the rise of different, uh, you know, more localized uh, uh, taxonomy, as mentioned uh, in uh, ASEAN or in the EU. Uh, in Korea, we have the uh, K taxonomy. China is one of uh, the first country in the world to launch a uh, green finance uh, taxonomy. Um, and there, uh, with all this. Uh, uh, Green taxonomy, I think, as a market, we are in a good place to have a good understanding what is green and what is not based on the activity. Um, uh, but with uh, the launch of all these uh, different silos, is also uh, creating, um, I think, blocks for our corporate to, to launch these transactions. So it's important uh, when we are structuring transaction to uh, make sure, according to your objective, uh, which type of investors uh, or financial institution you want to tap to apply the uh, applicable uh, taxonomy and also to make use of um, uh, important initiatives such as the common ground uh, taxonomy, um, uh, which uh, at the moment, uh, uh, the, the ambition of the common ground taxonomy, I think it was uh, addressed earlier, is to create a common language uh, in the green finance world. Um, but at the moment, uh, there's only uh, China and the EU uh, joining uh, this initiative. Initiative. Uh, but in the future, uh, because there are also many other uh, regulators from different countries joining the IPSF, there could be uh, different uh, uh, taxonomies joining uh, these initiatives as well. So uh, I think um, this uh, uh, making use of uh, this important initiative could be um, uh, could facilitate a more uh, channeling of funds, uh, global funds, uh, towards uh, green, green and sustainable projects. Um, so hopefully I give you a uh, um, quick overview of the size and landscape of the market and also uh, some uh, referential uh, in the future if you're uh, ready or interested to tap the sustainable finance market. Thank you.
Thank you, Ms. Zhang. Please be seated. May I now invite Mr. Yang Ji Wai, Director, Corporate Development of Capital Infrastructure, on stage. Mr. Yang, please. Hi, good morning, distinguished guests. Uh, it is an honor to be able to share and speak here this morning uh, in the, at this event. Uh, capital Infrastructure is a energy and environment focused arm. Uh, for Keppel Corporation, which is a global asset manager and operator uh, that's based in Singapore. So the topic of my presentation today is really around the opportunities that, that is available in Southeast Asia and also for us to share uh, what Keppel is doing in the region as well to see how we can capture these opportunities and uh, support the development of green infrastructure uh, in the region. So I think to start for the region, for Southeast Asia, I think it's important to start with the global energy trilemma and the challenges around the global macroeconomic trends. The benefit of Southeast Asia is really because of the current geopolitical environment, the current trends in, in green econo uh, economy. This has thrust Southeast Asia into the forefront as being an alternative to China as one on one aspect, and on the other aspect, being a close partner of China in terms of uh, development as well. The thing about Southeast Asia is that it is a very unique region. It is not a single block that uh, you can say, let's do this or let's do that, right? There's no central government that can direct the development of the economies. It is 10 different countries with its own unique uh, culture, language, and even very different governmental uh, uh, form of uh, government governance. So what we have seen is that different countries have taken a very uh, unique route in terms of their development. And uh, countries like, for example, Thailand and Malaysia have... Uh, taken up in terms of manufacturing of solar panels. Indonesia has taken up, uh, has grown into EV battery manufacturing. So Southeast Asia has tr been thrown to the forefront of green sustainable capex manufacturing. But at the same time, that level of development, that development of growth uh, has also exposed uh, the limitations in terms of existing infrastructure in country, in terms of energy security and uh, energy costs as well. And so I think the countries have also recognized this. And so we've seen that globally, a lot of investors and around the region as well have uh, put in a lot of focus into uh, developing their footprint in Southeast Asia. And a lot of it has been said by previous panelists as well or about the funding gap. Yes, there's a lot of funding that's going into the region, but there's still a big gap. Uh, in terms of fully bringing the potential of green investments into the region. Of course, when you are focused on green capex manufacturing, that form of manufacturing has also got to be supported by green energy that is being used. Uh, currently, Southeast Asia is still very fossil fuel heavy and uh, hydrocarbons driven. The the various countries, as on the back of recent COP26, COP27, have now been encouraged to put in place firm uh, commitments in terms of reaching net zero. Not every country in Southeast Asia has done yet, but more and more are doing so. So you see Indonesia, which traditionally is a very heavy coal-based uh, economy, now looking on the back of developing EV charging. It's also committed to a net zero target by 2060. Singapore, of course, uh, not, uh, it is not as easy for Singapore to reach net zero because as a country, it is 95% uh, driven by natural gas at present. But again, this is something that the government has committed to doing. And later, I will share a bit more about how uh, we as Keppel uh, support this transition for the country. Vietnam as well, Malaysia, all these countries have committed to net zero targets. 
And this brings to the fore opportunities for investments uh, along the themes of net zero, energy efficiency, decarbonization, and around the circular economy as well, as uh, previous panelists have mentioned. But I think that the real challenge as it relates to this uh, investment opportunities in, in these markets uh, is not just in the funding, which is very important, uh, but the funding is really, well, we need funding. There's a huge capital gap, as mentioned, um, both from public as well as private, and private not just from a debt perspective, but also from an equity perspective for investors to uh, be comfortable to go into these markets to help to drive uh, development. But at the same time, these countries and governments also need solutions providers, people who can help them uh, come in from a technology standpoint, from an operation standpoint, from a technical standpoint, to share best practices globally in terms of helping them facilitate the growth of their countries as well. So on that note, I segue into how Keppel uh, is built or set up to try to help facilitate this transition. Because again, Keppel as a, country, as a company is very tight with the development of Singapore as a country. And Singapore uh, faces many limitations as very similar to Hong Kong, very small country, uh, not a lot of resource, the only resource is human beings. Uh, even then, we don't have that many uh, human beings either. So a lot of the solutions that we try to do for Singapore is a solution that we believe also helps the development of other countries. And so uh, capital infrastructure, this is how we are set up. We, are, uh, we have a power and renewables business, power from gas and from, power and from renewables. Uh, we have an environment business as well, which houses our waste management business as well as our water uh, treatment business. Uh, the picture over there is also the integrated waste management facility that we are building in Hong Kong. Uh, and then our new energy business, which is focused not on solutions for today, but for solutions tomorrow. Uh, this is focused on our hydrogen business, our ammonia, as well as carbon capture initiatives. And then our energy as a service business, which is an integrated uh, solutions provider for densely populated cities like Singapore as well as Hong Kong. Um, our energy as a service is, as you think of Singapore, you think it's a very hot country, which is indeed the case. And that's why this is underpinned by our district cooling business as well, which is Singapore's first and largest district cooling provider. And we also uh, put in place uh, EV charging as well as CNI Solar to provide a one-stop solution. So to see how these different businesses uh, business lines come together to provide a solution for a city or a developing town. I think this is how we would encapsulate our one-stop shop sort of uh, solutions uh, that we have. So you can see uh, we generate power to support manufacturing, uh, be it from gas, from uh, solar. Uh, in the same time, through manufacturing, we can provide uh, this, uh, cooling as well to, to cool down buildings and to make it more energy efficient. We also treat water and the waste that comes out from that as well, we can we collect, we treat, we incinerate uh, to divert away from landfill. So I think while we claim that we do a lot of things in terms of providing solutions, I think the key thing is also as it relates to uh, the region of Southeast Asia. It, it is very unique in the sense, as I mentioned earlier, there's no one unifying overriding government policy maker that can direct a uh, common resource around. And so the way we approach Southeast Asia is we need to partner because there are 10 different countries in the region and there are different stakeholders in every different ma uh, market as well. And we develop best-in-class partnerships with in-country partners. And we share the knowledge because, again, while we are good on the technical side of things, we have capital 
uh, we may not necessarily understand the local market. And this is something that is a key challenge in Southeast Asia. We constantly try to uh, innovate and bring in new technologies, constantly improve um, the service offering that we have, and of course, to drive the, the sustainable solutions. So I think this, just in terms of case study-wise, uh, just to highlight some of the recent uh, initiatives that we are doing in Singapore and around the region in Southeast Asia, is that we just commissioned, uh, uh, we just reached financial close for a hydrogen ready uh, combined cycle gas turbine that we are building in Singapore. Uh, we have put in place, well, we have not put in place, but we have agreed and come to an agreement with various countries in ASEAN. Uh, so we have uh, path, well, we've created a pathfinder in the sense of uh, creating an ASEAN grid where we import electricity from Laos to Thailand to Malaysia and Singapore. Now, an ASEAN grid has always been a pipe dream because to get 10 countries to work together has always been a challenge. But this is a sort of a first project of linking many countries together. And from there, we are also seeking to uh, expand that. And so we recently also achieved uh, conditional approval to import one gigawatt of electricity from the Indochina region again. So there are a lot of these things that, uh, I mean, I focus on these two because these are the more ASEAN-centric uh, opportunities. And how we've been able to do that is at the G2G level, uh, while the governments talk to each other and talk about wanting to do something like that, uh, at the end of the day, whether a project is feasible and can be done, is still going to be left to the private sector to be able to facilitate and make it facilitate it and make it bankable and make it commercially viable as well. And this uh, is why on all these projects, we have partnered with local leading players in market. The, the initial facilitation by government was there, but from there on, it was public, uh, private sector all the way in terms of making these projects to come to fruition. So that is the, the energy import side of things. Uh, we are also in the process of developing Harmonia solutions as well. And this we are doing with many large partners. Government again starts the initial discussion, but implementation again is through working together with various leading parties uh, and we have MOUs with uh, Green Coal to develop ammonia in India, uh, with Pertamina in uh, Indonesia, develop ammonia through uh, geothermal energy, and also that for import to Singapore, and also in Australia. And then I think on the waste side of things as well, uh, we are putting in place so while we have, we operate half of the incineration capacity in Singapore, we also note that moving forward, we need to try to direct away the emissions. And so we are also putting in place carbon capture initiatives. So I think in conclusion, the point is, there are a lot of opportunities. The market is very big. Uh, there's a lot of tailwinds driving the sector. But rather than doing it in a disorderly way, we need to be focused in terms of what can be done and what cannot be done, who we need to partner with and direct and be very focused in terms of uh, driving this development. Because with this, the amount of money that is being talked about, as previous panelists have said, it's very easy for all this money to go to waste into projects that don't take place. I think where we come in and a lot of uh, different key players is we need to be focused to find the projects that are bankable, the projects that can come to fruition, and projects that can be commercial. And then only that, working together, both private sector as well as with the public sector, can we uh, really you know, capture the opportunities in, in these markets. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Yang. Please remain on stage and be seated. I would like to invite our panel chair of the session, Ms. Jenny Lee, and other panelists, including Dr. Vincent Zhang, Ms. Carmen Zhang,
welcome Mr. Lomond Jam back on stage. Ms. Lee, over to you, please. Great. Um, thank you um, to the uh, panel speakers. That was really insightful um, discussion. I think we have um, 15 minutes uh, for this discussion, but I would like to leave um, some time for the audience to ask some questions as well, because I'm sure you know these have um, prompted um, a lot more thoughts in terms of how do we actually take a lot of these conversations and turn them into action. Um, I wanted to really um, take a closer look, actually, in terms of the funding um, gaps um, that we've talked about. Um, we, we've heard from the financial secretary that the government has um, demonstrated and shows strong support in terms of its commitment to greening um, the infrastructure here in Hong Kong and also uh, working together in collaboration with the GBA. Um, and also in terms of the private sector, we're seeing an increase in terms of um, green bond, uh, sustainability linked to bond issuance um, year on year. And also from the corporate side, um, you know, they have also increased um, their debt issuance um, using Hong Kong as a uh, financial um, hub. But I guess um, in terms of infrastructure financing, because that is actually requiring um, financing at a much, um, I guess, longer term with a different type of return and risk profile. Um, and so I guess this is a question for Carmen in terms of, um, you know, we have the government um, that is providing a lot of this public support, um, but from a private sector um, and from a financing um, side, how do you see kind of like the developments um, for investments going into this um, infrastructure? Um, and um, do, you, do you see any kind of like challenges um, with this? Um, for sure. Uh, first of all, as a financial institution, um, we are, uh, has, as I said, very, you know, take pride in being a green bank. Uh, we have started green lending a uh, long time ago and started one of the uh, world's first um, sustainable banking team focusing only in green finance. Uh, and our approach is uh, not just, uh, you know, uh, focusing on, on, on our own, uh, building our own green lending portfolio, but also helping our client to uh, transition, especially for uh, those that in, in more carbon intensive sector. Um, and the key challenges I see, especially here in the greater, Ch uh, greater China, is uh, the green bond, green loan market uh, internationally has been a voluntary market. Uh, we, uh, financial institutions uh, or, or, or th um, thought leaders, they, uh, as a community, we, we set up our own uh, uh, rules, uh, green standards, uh, you know, uh, structures, guidelines, such as the green loan principle. Uh, but then for a lot of uh, uh, more local uh, or regional banks here in, in Asia, in greater China, uh, a point our conversation uh, with many of them, uh, they, they find it difficult to digest such a um, you know vast uh, vast uh, uh, market and and ever changing standards like uh, as mentioned now except for the green loan principle uh, when it comes to taxonomy we have so many different taxonomy uh, uh, I, I saw one source saying uh, now we have more than 200 taxonomies in the world. And so uh, if, if you ask me uh, the, the key challenges and the wish list, um, and, and I understand the Hong Kong government is working on this as well, is to have um, a clearer you know, uh, taxonomy or a disclosure standard or, uh, or guidelines for uh, financial institution based in Hong Kong to um, expand their green lending portfolio. Because for now, there's no... Uh, official or any uh, one single uh, taxonomy here. Yeah, and then definitely more, um, more um, I think, uh, incentive for uh, investor side and lender side as well. As mentioned, like the green bond market so far has been expanding uh, year after year, but it's mainly investor, uh, sorry, in, in issuer driven. Uh, it, on the investor side, uh, we see you know some very sophisticated investor uh, pushing for ESG, um, but you know uh, we, we really want to see more uh, of this in in, in uh, especially in APAC because uh, it's still more a uh, EU and US uh, investor base that are more ESG driven. Uh, so um, another wish list from the uh, from the government or, or regulators uh, or, or stakeholders is to provide more incentive. It doesn't have to be financial for um, uh, banks and um, investors to, to uh, start, to kickstart their, their green investment portfolio. No, 
that's, that, that's great, thank you. Um, and I guess in terms of um, going to um, Chiwe, in terms of we've just heard your presentation, I thought it was fascinating in terms of that public-private partnership cooperation. How, um, and if you can share some more insights in terms of how do you select and identify, cover on the private side, um, those partnerships um, and how you identify kind of like, um, and monitor and measure, I guess, those um, successes of those uh, projects over time. Thanks. Yeah, it is, it is indeed uh, quite a challenging uh, endeavor to find the right partner uh, in, this, in various markets. But I think that's where the initial push for, at the G2G level, at the pub, public sector, to connect a lot of the main players. Now, in taking Southeast Asia as an example, uh, the, big, the big boys in market are pretty established at present in the, in the more established markets. So for example, Indonesia, Thailand, Malaysia, uh, by and large, the partners that we do work with are the likes of you know, Petronas, Pertamina, the big, the big boys. But I think you know, when it comes to going into the next level beyond the big state-owned entities and dropping to the next level of private, uh, again, we, we will look at the first instance to partner up, uh, well, it's a function of deepening the partnership in phases. So while the government gives us the initial link, uh, we work together, we start on smaller projects together and see how the projects uh, work out before we progress into bigger and bigger projects. I think the benefit of uh, the opportunities in market right now is that there are so many that uh, you can afford to start off a bit smaller and then slowly try to uh, grow from there. So for example, one of our portfolio companies in Cambodia uh, is a waste collection business. Uh, we, that business was brought into Cambodia uh, via a government initiative, uh, partnered up with a local Cambodian company. And uh, from there, we've started small. It's only a thousand tons per day of collection. But then, as the relationship progresses, as we monitor how the collection cycle is being done, the payment cycles are being done, and from there, we look to see how we expand that, uh, that relationship further on. That's great, thank you. Um, and um, it's really good to um, hear, I think, examples um, from o overseas as well in the ASEAN in terms of how we can also adopt some of these um, correct practices in Hong Kong. Um, I guess, um, Vincent, you know, um, you know, our come out being very um, instrumental, I guess, and also um, influential come back in this particular space. Um, what type of um, initiatives um, are you seeing come back in the horizon in terms of, in terms of project opportunity in Hong Kong um, and in the GBA and come out this potential for this uh, public-private partnerships that we can consider? Okay, uh, start with uh, GBA, because I think uh, um, this is a very interesting and quite, uh, to some extent, promising uh, uh, land that uh, we can expand that business. Uh, we've been op op operating there for more than you know, four decades. Uh, we know that uh, uh, the, the market actually is also uh, you know, polarized. On one hand, that we have uh, some very developed cities uh, like Shenzhen, Guangzhou, and the kind of a problem they're facing is quite similar to us, you know, waste, energies, and water, and, and sort of, uh, you know, uh, uh, green provision needs to be in place. But uh, on the other hand, uh, there are some other uh, less developed uh, there in the coming years. I'm sure that a lot of uh, new uh, infrastructure need, be, uh, need to be uh, uh, in place, including you know, railway, a lot of uh, subway, and, and importantly, I mean, electrifying a car. So they actually provide a lot of uh, opportunity for investor, and importantly, if that can be you know, bankable, that uh, a lot of uh, you know, uh, quality kind of uh, projects for, for us to work on. Uh, on, on the other hand, uh, uh, GBA also uh, can have kind of advantages that is also kind of a, a R&D center. You know, a lot of um, uh, world-class kind of, you know, company uh, actually uh, located there, you know, BYD and uh, you know, Tencent and, and uh, also other you know, working there. They actually uh, uh, own a lot of you know, capitals, uh, uh, human capital in particular. They actually can help uh, us you know, the, uh, move uh, Quicker actually, and also take the lead uh, globally on developing kind of a, a well and uh, well uh, leading kind of technology. Now. So I think uh, as a business, as an investment, as a, 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 you know um, uh, market, I think that that actually can create a lot of interesting 
uh, works. So I think uh, all in all, I think uh, importantly, we have to you know uh, leverage the kind of advantages uh, that we can provide by this particular uh, you know platform, which is Hong Kong, on the capitals, uh, both human and you know, financial capitals, and help uh, have more kind of uh, integrations uh, into the kind of uh, you know operation uh, there. So these are kind of the direction I think we should uh, move on. Of course, that uh, uh, in Hong Kong, uh, the market. Uh, Quite, uh, quite uh, well defined, and what we need to do actually is the kind of uh, you know, concert efforts together with uh, all the party here, uh, including overseas kind of investor, in work together to make it uh, quicker and faster in the kind of transformation. And um, and Norman, in terms of I guess the development, you've, you spoke very much on like waste management. What is um, Fiola doing more in terms of like within the GBA, and where do you see kind of like, the opportunities for that expansion from a financing perspective as well? Yeah, but I, I think uh, you know in terms of uh, private uh, public private uh, partnership, uh, Hong Kong and you know different parts of the or, or, or different parts of the world could be different. Uh, as I mentioned, the Hong Kong government has quite a lot of reserves in their account, and so uh, they are very often like to retain uh, control of their assets. So uh, from a, let's say from an environmental protection department in Hong Kong, uh, the, contra uh, the contract mechanism is usually design, build, operate. And so basically, uh, that means the government is investing in the construction of the plan. So the uh, contractor, would only be a, a contractor of the project where they only have to manage uh, the cash flow of the project. So uh, they would often be paid on a, either a milestone or progress payment. So in terms of investment, it, they really have to manage a very short uh, cash flow issue, managing the cash in and the cash out to uh, uh, the payable, uh, cash payable to uh, the suppliers and, or the subcontractors. And once the plan is finished, then they would be paid an operation fee. Uh, in the GBA or in other parts of the world, uh, they are more flexible and open to PPP, where the build operate, tran where build operate transfer could be a mechanism uh, to be employed. And in that sense, it means that the environmental management infrastructure is actually privatized. And so the company is responsible to invest for the uh, uh, infrastructure. So during the construction phase, you would not have any revenue coming in, and you would only recover your capital expenditure during the operation phase of the project. So very often, you would negotiate, depending on the nature of the con contract, obviously, you would very often negotiate for a 20 to a 30 year operation period in order to recover your capital cost. And uh, let's take uh, maybe sewer treatment as an example. Uh, the, the contract itself might be different from uh, a municipal solid waste or an incinerator, for example, uh, because of the nature of its um, of its setup. For sewer treatment, you basically have a you could say you have a monopoly in that area because you would be able, because a lot of times you won't be able to divert the flow to another plant. Having said that, when you're investing in this type of infrastructure, you are basing your design on the master plan made by the government. So in this type of contract, very often you would negotiate for a uh, sort of a take or pay uh, volume or a minimum payment so that you would be protected in case if there is no flow going to your plan. Having said that, on the other hand, if it's a solid waste treatment, it is different because then you have to be responsible for the feedstock in that area. And for a solid waste management, you could actually bring the waste to another incinerator, uh, incinerator or for a landfill, for example. And because it's market driven, a lot of times you could actually reduce the price, unlike uh, you know, for a sewer treatment plant. And so uh, in that sense, uh, some of the companies would actually invest in the collection side in order to ensure their feedstock as well. And so these are some of the uh, protection that you might require to negotiate uh, in your contract terms uh, to ensure that you would be protected in terms of your assets. 
And uh, these are actually some of the projects that we have ongoing in, uh, in the GBA and also in uh, other parts of the world as well. That's great. Uh, we are almost, um, unfortunately, out of time. I could probably sit and talk and uh, listen to the, our speakers uh, for the whole day. Um, but I think to s summarize, I think um, in terms of this uh, financing cover the transition for um, a green infrastructure and a sustainable one um, is complex. Um, I think in terms of how um, financing will um, be allocated will be an ongoing negotiation uh, process and it really will require um, the public and also the private um, sector to come together to collaborate and to really um, work in terms of um, achieving our climate goals. Um, I'm not sure, do we have time for any Q&A um, from the audience? Or oh, no? Do we, can we take one question from the audience? Um, I, I guess I would like to just open the floor up to see if anyone um, in the audience um, has a question for any of our panel speakers. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm David Chan from uh, Amo Solar. We're a solar energy provider. Uh, my question is, is it's very, very, very interesting what all you guys have talked about, but the um, financing is mainly focused on the investment side, which is at conception, even at, for even when Arabs talking about the design. Our issue is, is a, uh, further down, down the line, where project and, uh, and even the contractor level, uh, we go to bank uh, to ask for financing. It's normally just traditional banking finance. Uh, we probably get about what, 25 basis point reduction in loan because it's, it's, it's kind of a green project. But what we'd like to see if uh, from institution and also that uh, whether is it possible to, uh, to consider providing a better financial structure for companies that invest in, in the provider of, uh, of energies uh, um, so that it just make, you know, it, it moved the dial to a different point. The second question relates to, I think, for, for Arabs, is that when you do your design, in, 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 it's, it's great, all these very high-level uh, uh, infrastructure design project, but when it comes to the detail, it's very often it doesn't quite goes to the point of the latest technology in terms of, uh, I mean, for solar panel, for instance, we're currently assisting uh, some of the uh, big infrastructure client on, on that. But at a point when we help them, it's actually too late to, because uh, it's already set in the specification in the design. Perhaps it might be something for the future for, for industry to move, not just at government or design, but more to the manufacturer to the point where people actually provide them. So um, just, just that's just a comment. I guess, um, Carmen, in terms of, I guess, um, within um, your firm and institution, there's, you offer like a wide range of different types of projects as it relates, or financing as it relates to green. So um, would you like to answer the question? Yeah, I think um, a very interesting comment and, and, and very valid. Uh, our bank's approach definitely uh, the first step is to um, hopefully through a uh, formal internal mechanism to tilt our lending portfolio towards green sectors and green projects. So as you mentioned, if you're already getting like a, a formal discount from your bank uh, due to the project being green, I think that is already a great step forward because uh, here in APAC, um, I understand uh, that that uh, so-called greenium is not uh, necessarily uh, guaranteed yet, um, and and for sure we we are uh, it's also a mandate to uh, try to diversify ESG integration across different financial solution. Um, yeah, so so this point uh, definitely taken. Ten seconds feedback. Uh, thanks for for coming. In, indeed, I think uh, we have uh, done what we could. I mean uh, to get as many as possible that uh, latest uh, innovation and also LE in the projects. You may have known that uh, we did that in zero common buildings. So uh, the challenge is how can we make uh, that become uh, business as usual as uh, what I mean the industry need to work on. Of course, we also need uh, the support, not only the uh, financial, more importantly, the owners uh, themselves you know, to buy in that concept. So I think how we could uh, you know, um, uh, work together to develop a kind of uh, a plan 
which is uh, you know practicable and also you know sustainable. I think it's a common challenge for everyone on that. To get uh, all the zero uh, zero uh, carbon buildings or infrastructure uh, in wider scales, bigger scale, quicker scale. Maybe just a word. Uh, I think in Hong Kong, especially, uh, where specifications or projects are very prescriptive in terms of its uh, specifications, uh, it, there could be consideration of changing it to a more performance-based, uh, you know, approach, uh, where the specifications are not so uh, rigid. And that allows, uh, you know, different suppliers or subcontractors to propose their solutions accordingly. So it could be another way forward in terms of expediting uh, some of the works as well. Great. Um, I think we've really run out of time. Um, but thank you for, to the audience for actually um, listening and um, contributing to kind of like, um, learning more about um, how we can green the economy. And thank you so much to our panel speakers uh, for your insights today. Thank you. Thank you to our panel chair and all the panelists for the insightful discussion. Please come forward for a group photo first. Please remain on stage and come forward for a group photo. Thank you, panel chair and all the panelists. Please be seated. This brings us to the end of the first session. We will now have a break before our next session on green technology, which will start at 11 and 5. Thank you. Welcome back. We will begin our second session today, entitled Green Technology. It is our honor to have Mr. Vincent Marr to be our keynote speaker. Mr. Marr is the Chief Executive Officer of Hong Kong Shamchan Innovation and Technology Park. Mr. Marr, please. Good morning. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm really privileged to have the chance uh, today to, um, to tell you about our story, Hong Kong Samjun Innovation and Technology Park. I can assure you, this is a very, very exciting project for the park, for our people, and I, I'm, I hope we can actually make it very exciting for the city and also possibly for the nations. So our, uh, our park uh, is positioned as a bridgehead for INT cooperation. This actually comes from the 14th five-year plan of the National Economic and Social uh, uh, Policies of the, of, of the nations that we need to put GBA as one of the major INT center for the country. And the Samjun Hong Kong uh, together form and Ke Tao um, cooperation uh, park is actually a um, major puzzle in this uh, plan. So where are we? We are actually on the uh, southern side of the Samchan River. The river uh, actually on the, the other side is actually the Samchan INT zone. The two of us together form the Ke Tao Samchan Hong Kong Science and Technology Innovation Cooperation Zone. So this is a very, very important area that in future there will be a lot of exclusive policies and uh, implementations of initiatives uh, to enhance the cooperations between the country and Hong Kong. And we are also part of Sentin Tetlopo. Sentin Tetlopo, uh, I think, I hope you, you may have heard about it. It is going to be a major development in Hong Kong. A thousand 
1,100 hectare, and uh, there will be another 150 hectares of land, hectares of land that will be used for INT. In um, now, our HSITP is going to have 88 hectares of land. So put things in perspective. How big is 88 hectares? Hong Kong Science Park today has, is around, in space-wise or land-wise, is around 22 hectares. So we are going to be, from a land perspective, is four times of Science Park. In the previous uh, um, event, uh, actually it's an Arab event, and I heard uh, um, our Deputy Financial Secretary uh, saying the government has committed that there will be land supply for INT. The amount of land supply is going to be 20 times of today's science power. And HSITP occupies that 20%, and there will be much more coming. So you can see the commitment from the government to make Hong Kong to become a very, very strong INT center. The basic, very important attributes of land is going to be resolved. Now, but among all those, our park is going to be the earliest in terms of availability of land, and we are going to be the closest to the border. So our park, our vision is to be a world-class knowledge hub and INT center. We are going to focus on six pillars, life and health technology, artificial intelligence, artificial intelligence and data science, new, eco uh, new uh, materials, new energy, robotics, and microelectronics. And on that, we are going to uh, make available advanced manufacturing, which is the high-end, very high-end manufacturing of no matter it's life, and life science products or energy products or new material products or robotics. The park will be developed in two phases. Um, the western side will be phase one. That will start the development. We'll uh, divide the phase one into three branches. The first branch will include eight buildings. That I'm going to show you later what are those buildings. And they will be, we will basically fund and build it and use the current science park model to lease it to startups and the prices. And then the batch two and batch three, which will be another major piece of supply of land, we are considering different development models, including the public-private partnership model. We will invite investors or self or maybe pharmaceutical companies to come to, to, uh, to get the land parcels and build. The phase two, which is on the eastern side, will be reserved for future development. For batch one egg buildings, um, there will be uh, altogether four wet labs for life science. There will be three dry labs and, or office buildings, which possibly will be uh, around the same specifications. And there will be one inno cell. That's basically the first inno cell in the park. There will be many more coming. So the batch 1A, which we, we, which basically is a blue color, will be two wet labs and the inno cell will start to be competed from end 2024 onwards. We have already started the construction. Now, in the building of this uh, or in design of this park, we are very committed to make it a very sustainable park net zero, no carbon, on NO no or LOW no carbon. And um, basically, so in the master layout planning, we have already achieved it, the BIM plus neighborhood pattern rating. With the, actually, we got the highest score among all the other existing projects. We try to cover those um, aspects from uh, community aspects, or site aspects, or, or say for some open space, green corridors, or from a material waste uh, and waste aspects, aspects or say smart waste uh, ma management or energy aspects. I'm, uh, and in the essence of time, I'm, I'm not going to go through all the details and I'm not an expert on those technical details neither, so bear with me. I think that from a park perspective, we are a greenfield project. So basically, we are the best position to be a showcase for a net zero park. So from a project planning perspective, from a construction perspective, we are going to try to make references to different types of best practices, technologies, solutions, and we will try to adopt it as much as we can in the park. We, will, we are going to use BIM uh, um, and DFM, DFMA, uh, MIC, et cetera. We are in, the, in the design phase, we have actually got the go award for, uh, from the HAIBIM in 2020. Uh, so basically, you can see 
this kind of uh, sustainability ambitions, natural ambitions, actually start right start from uh, a few years ago when we first kick start the project. Future, what we will do is we will try to adopt the latest technologies, invite partners to come to work with us together to try new technologies from the green needs, from uh, transport, from energy, etc. And we are going to set up our own net zero science-based targets and abatement measures by end of 2023, which is end of this year. We are also going to build an open digital platform, which try to absorb all the data generated within the park, uh, from district cooling, from uh, building management, et cetera, et cetera. And we are going to provide all the super uh, high performance computing power, super computing power, cloud, et cetera, to make use of those data, to create an AI model to make use of those data. And as a matter of fact, even when we go enter into the public private partnership model, we are possibly going to uh, require our partners to provide to open up the data to, for us to access so that we can actually perform the real-time monitoring from the whole park's perspective. So, so much about uh, the park in a physical perspective from a net zero sustainability perspective. At the end, we need the park to be very competitive. So, we see our park are very competitive from five different angles. One, cost boundary convenience. So, we are going to be the first batch of lands available in this IND ambitions of the, of, of the city. And we are going to be the closest to the, to the China border. So we can get access to a much bigger GBA market, much bigger talent pool from, from, from the PRC, from Samjun or from GBA. And, but we are, at the same time, we have very easy access to all the top universities in Hong Kong to enable us to have uh, all the talents, especially those best of breed talents, like for example, uh, we are very especially strong in uh, basic research, uh, life science, etc. So we will get access to all those talents. We will try to pull all those talents into the park. Finance and ego is always the, uh, a big plus in the, in the city. So we will continue to be uh, using a robust legal system based on common law. We are going to enjoy the benefits of like a very, very strong um, 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 listing rules uh, supporting the IPOs, say for example, the 18A. The other thing is exclusive cost boundary policies. In the setup of this Ketao cooperation zone, the, the country, the central government, has already uh, highlighted the very, uh, one, one major, very important theme is we are going to be a trial of all the implementation of cost boundary policies uh, in an exclusive way in the, in the Ketao area. That will include, very importantly, the flow of INT materials capital, data, and talents between Hong Kong and Samchan. And currently, there are a lot of rigorous discussions among, uh, all for, for on all these topics among the two governments to make it uh, available as soon as we can uh, and to make it announced and execute. And as a matter of fact, this is, as you can imagine, this is also from a market sounding study perspective that we have just conducted uh, like a few months ago. This is the most shelf after support from, from, from the market. Apart from land, cost boundary policies that I try to highlight in red, they are granted, okay? So how can we make this park successful? We believe we need to build an, an, eco, an enterprise friendly ecosystem with critical mass. The critical mass will include sufficient enterprises, bringing sufficient or good, the best of breed R&D initiatives uh, to land in the park. We need to attract the best talents from top universities locally, from mainland or from overseas. We will provide all the supporting policies and incentives to make our tenants feel like home here, and we will make ourselves very competitive. We will need for, to support the talents to do R&D, we will have platforms, accelerators, or from a life science perspective, say for example, contract research organizations to help them, to provide them with shared resources, advice, to help them to do the R&D. We are going to invite all the relevant uh, offices, uh, all, all the relevant bodies, uh, in terms of certification, accreditation, or um, even government liaison, because 
very, uh, when, when we look at one of the initiatives is we're going to do public-private partnership model. We are going to um, uh, offer land parcels uh, for enterprise to come to build. Construction is another area that we know is not easy in Hong Kong, so we'll, help, we'll get help from the government to have a liaison uh, office here. Uh, we will provide funding access, we will provide commercialization uh, capabilities, including our advanced manufacturing cap capabilities to help the, the R&D uh, uh, enterprises to, say for example, to do uh, high-end products or to produce prototype uh, uh, or, or um, um, to be used in the, uh, for their commercialization. So we need, I think, there are a lot of things that is needed. La land and cost boundary policies are granted. And then uh, and basically we will enable all the other things, including talents and enterprise, to be able to make the, big in the biggest impact in the park. This is going to be a talent-centric park. Uh, we are not just going to cover or address the needs of our talents or enterprise. We are going to address their families' needs. Say, for example, accommodations, hotels, international schools, entertainment, uh, commercial retail facilities, sports. So we will make this park a very livable park, very competitive and livable park for all the high-end talents here. And talent will enjoy seamless cost boundary access, including um, there will be a lot more child spur line and MTR station inside the park. And there is a footbridge across the Samchan River, 200 meters. Basically, talents in our park or in, in the Samchan Park can easily um, get access to each other. I just learned that even before the MTR station in the park is available, we have actually have a private role from the current Lok Ma Chow Park, uh, Lok Ma Chow MTR station. Uh, the row length is around 700 meters. That actually, we can actually deploy our environmental friendly uh, shuttle vehicles to, to bring people from the MTR station to our park. And actually, because 700 meters is, is quite walkable, especially, I mean, it's going to be an enjoyable walk, uh, like 10, uh, within 15 minutes from MTR station to our park. So what we try to do is we are going to build a world-class knowledge hub and INT center that is going to be less zero, resource efficient, and climate resilient for our talents and the enterprises. And we have very strong five competitive advantages. That's all I want to share. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ma. Please remain on stage. Now, may I invite our panel chair, Dr. Lawrence Jung, and other panelists, Ms. Colly Chan, Mr. Aldo Alver, and Mr. Andy Wong on stage for the panel discussion. Dr. Dr. Chang, over to you, please. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, good morning. Um, I think we have a good show today. <laughs> <laughs> now, I think we are focusing on green economy and also green tech uh, in this particular session. Um, now, for Hong Kong to be the preferred regional hub of green infrastructure and investment, we need a concerted effort from a lot of people to make that happen. We will need uh, important aspects, such as from the government support, land support, infrastructure, uh, technology tools, and all that uh, to make that happen. And today, we are very indeed very privileged to have here uh, the leading experts and representative of all these support to give us an insight on how to make Hong Kong a preferred hub for green uh, infrastructure and investment. Uh, on my left, we have uh, uh, Vincent, uh, Mr. Vincent Ma, the Chief Executive of uh, Hong Kong Shenzhen Innovation and Technology Park. And then we have Kali, Kali Chen, of GM of uh, Morning, Microsoft. Everyone. Yeah, GM of Microsoft, uh, Hong Kong, and Macau. And then beside her, we have Adele Elver. I hope I pronounced your name correctly. It's correct. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and uh, uh, Adele is the President and Chief Executive Officer of Siemens, Hong Kong, and Macau. And then last but not the least, of course, we have from the government, Mr. Andy Wong, the Head of Innovation and Technology in West Hong Kong. Good morning. Thank you. 
Oh, so the first question go to the to the government representative, Andy. Now, for Hong Kong to achieve our green objectives with the support of the newly uh, 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 released the innovation and technology development blueprint, we need new technology. We need new methodology uh, with innovative business process. Uh, some of this will come from uh, external companies, uh, new companies from outside of Hong Kong. And what is the government doing to attract the foreign investment and companies to Hong Kong? And what support uh, will the government be giving these companies? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lawrence. I think, uh, let me address the first question. I think the first question is easy question. So what the government has done to attract foreign investment? That's why we have Invest Hong Kong. Because our role is to attract foreign investment, to promote, to let them know what happened in Hong Kong, and then what are the government policy to address different areas, right? And then by the time they decided to come to Hong Kong, we help them to support them to set up the business in Hong Kong. So that's the uh, role to do for attracting foreign investment. The second question about what kind of a policy has been done by the government to attract and also to promote the green development. I think um, it covers a couple of things, right? To start with, the Carbon um, Action Plan 2050, right? So there are four uh, major uh, decarbonization strategy. The one is about the uh, net zero uh, generation. So that's why we are uh, replacing the coal-fired generation by the new energy source, right? So, and, and then, um, the second one is about the uh, new building and also energy saving. And from the government perspective, we are using different policy. For example, uh, when you build a building, right, so um, you, with the green element, you can have a GFA concession. Uh, to try to promote EV charging facility, we also adopt the uh, G, uh, uh, GFA concession as well. So there's some policy to drive the uh, adoption of green. And also the government also have the pro innovation procurement strategy to try to encourage the adoption of, of innovation into the government project as well. The third about the strategy is about the green trans transportation. That's why we have the uh, EV car vehicle, and then we're facing out the fossil fuel vehicle, and also we are trying to use the, um, promoting the hydrogen fuel cell for using in the bus and also the heavy vehicle. The last one is about the um, waste management. That's why we see that we have different park, old park, I park, and also those will be converting the waste into the energy facility. All of them are requiring massive uh, infrastructure investment in this case. So for green, um, it's a small word, but it's uh, disruptive because it disrupts the whole economy. Um, and then it's a transformative because, uh, for example, um, I had in the um, seminar the other day about the um, industry 4.0. Uh, advanced manufacturing, people is doing the manufacturing using sensor, IoT, to automate the production. But what is missing part is the green part. So what they are doing is to put the green part into the production line as well. So to, uh, in order to achieve the full industry 4.0, that's why it's a transform transformative. And also it's a massive. Um, it cut across all the different industry. For example, in our organization, we set up a new a team, which is a carbon neutrality team. And then the reason why we set it up in our organization, because the green will touching the green finance, touching the green technology, as well as the application as well. So it's massive, because the opportunity is massive over there. Uh, in terms of the other uh, policy that are happening in, in, um, in Hong Kong, uh, particular for the R&D facility. We have a matching fund, so um, we have different policy to match the funding for corporate who invest into the R&D. So it's a one-to-one -one matching kind of scheme. Uh, also, we have uh, what we call a profit um, deduction, our R&D uh, profit deduction. So if a company who invests into the R&D, the cost uh, up to two million will be three times, two million, six million of profit tax deduction, and then above that will be two times of what the remaining. So there's a low upper limit as well. And also there will be 40% of R&D uh, infrastructure spending will be cash rebate to the company, and also research talent hub, etc. And also to and um, one of the key elements for uh, making green or any other R&D is we need talent. I continue to. <laughs> It's a, bit, it's a bit long policy. So <laughs> that's why I'm thinking going. all the time. So uh, also the talent, right? So in order to attract the talent, we got top talent pass scheme and also a very kind of a talent scheme to grab the talent to Hong Kong. 
Um, this top talent uh, pass scheme, and uh, I think in the last three, four months, we already approved uh, more than 10,000 applications as well. So this all policy is, is happening in Hong Kong. One last point, um, we want to address all those different uh, technology companies. That's why um, last year, uh, late last year, we set up an office called Oasis, Office for Attracting Strategic Companies to Hong Kong. And in the past, Hong Kong, what I mentioned about in the past about the policy is all transparent. It's level paying field for everyone. In order to attract some strategic company come to Hong Kong to set up an office, that may be necessary to some specific, uh, special package, like the land we need to provide, like the tax incentive we need to provide, and also some financial access to those companies. So we will have a token package to offer to specific company who had will bring uh, economic benefit to Hong Kong, and then we will offer a bespoken package to them. And then the, per, the department that is looking after this is called Oasis, which is our, our used to be our colleague who spin off from our department to set up the Oasis office. And then it will be a, a, a connector to connect all different government departments to provide this bespoken pack, package. And then 30 billion Hong Kong dollars has been set aside for the co investment fund for this uh, kind of a uh, uh, company who want to set up their business in Hong Kong. So thank you. Thank you, Andy. <laughs> yes, good. As you can see, uh, I can attest to it. I think the Hong Kong SAR government is very generous in providing different kind of funding support to the industries in Hong Kong and also in attracting overseas company to Hong Kong. Uh, take a guess how many funding schemes that the government have in Hong Kong. We have over 50 different kind of funding schemes in, in Hong Kong. So I think at least one of them would be suitable to you. So if you need to have more information, ask Andy or ask me, and I think we will probably be able to help you in, with that. Now, after talking about the government, we will look at it from the different, kind, different side, a different uh, perspective. We look at it from the commercial sector. I think for the commercial sector, for, for a start, we would like to know um, I think this question will be for Kali and Adele. Uh, for, for a start, we would like to know what kind of green initiatives your own companies would have, and uh, how is your company going to achieve carbon neutral or even carbon negative? That's one question. The second question is that, uh, what is the offering uh, of your company uh, are providing the technology means to help others, basically the green tech, to achieve the green or the ESG objectives. As you know, ESG has been so hot lately. I think lady first, Kelly first, thank you. Uh, Lawrence, thanks for the ask. Uh, on the topics of green economy or sustainability, Microsoft, indeed, we start early, you know? Uh, we are already net zero in 2012. Now it's 2023, then maybe in your mind, then call it then, what next, of course, and for Microsoft, we indeed have made a patch. Our patch is we target by 2030, we will achieve carbon negative zero rays. And by 2025, we'll use 100% renewable energy. By 2050, we target to remove all the carbon we have create and generate since Microsoft establishments in 1975. Okay, then maybe in your mind, wow, what are ambitions? How we are going to make this happen? I think it's a combination of driving accountability and by leverage the power of technologies. In terms of driving accountability, in Microsoft indeed, you know, uh, we do have a concept called carbon tax. Then that means different business units head. We do need to accountable uh, for our own carbon emissions to make sure uh, for each business unit, we have the accountabilities to achieve the company target. Okay, then regarding about um, how we make this happen, we have a free our methodology. What this three R means, the first R is about how we record it. The second is how we report it. The last one is about how we reduce it. Then of course, Microsoft is a technology company. We leverage technology because we have a strong belief that technology have an important part to play in the green economies. In terms of record and report, 
we leverage the power of cloud and AI and also working together with our partner like Siemens or Schneider Difference um, um, or even SGS because I also know some of our partner in, in the conference as well. And we're working together with them by leverage the power of cloud technologies, IoT device. We measure the carbon emission. But just measure is not sufficient. It's how we also leverage the power of AI to understand uh, with all the carbon emission we collect, what are the key problem area so that when we said we would like to reduce it, what are the focus areas? Then we, mm, and at the same time, besides just measure, we also will, will according to the historical data to give us idea or with the latest technology, how we can go into remove it so as to give us some recommendation on some of the possible milestone indeed we can achieve by leverage the power of technology, by leverage the power of cloud. It, indeed, it is also the reason why Microsoft, we can lay down so detailed blueprint on this one. This is about record and report. But the key is how we reduce it. Cloud indeed play an important part or in. Because for Microsoft, we said that by 2025, we'll use 100% renewable energies. Then about our data center design, about the use of our uh, energy. You know, moving application from on-prem data center to cloud can reduce carbon emission as much as 98%. <laughs> then that means one of the in the incentive for Microsoft and also for our uh, customer or partner moving to the cloud, not only because it can give them more agility and prepare for AI, indeed in terms of carbon mm, and control carbon reduction ha ha have a key part to pay moving to the cloud. The second one is we, we keep on saying that um, hybrid working. Microsoft, you know that we do have our hybrid working solution, which allow our employee to work anytime, anywhere. And we believe that uh, this type of hybrid working tools um, will become the new normal, not just because in COVID, because of social distancing. And we do have some statistics that say that if you allow your employee one day remote working per week, one year, is equivalent to you save ten tree. Then that means it means something. It means something. Mm -hmm. And also, besides this one, you know, Microsoft, we are also very conscious about um, the carbon emissions from the building. So we are moving to a new campus. In a new campus, we are using different type of IoT device um, uh, to monitor the energy consumptions and at the same time have some um, sensor to control the energy level. And moving to the new campus basically can also help us to reduce our carbon emissions by around 20%. I think this is how Microsoft is going to make this happen. I think thanks um, for the progression of ESG, particularly in the uh, investment field, I understand that right now a lot of um, sizable company or especially listed company, they do have a lot of uh, incentive um, on this area because we all understand that indeed carbon emissions do have highly relevance for the credit rating, uh, for the interest rate, and indeed also affect their PE ratio. So for Microsoft, we do receive a lot of inquiry on that topics. And then what is our tips or what is our have for those companies so that they can have a progression on uh, their sustainability journey. Basically, there's a couple of things. We keep on telling them that um, they can use a formula, CSR. What CSR means, the first one is moving to the cloud because, um, as I said earlier, moving to the cloud can help them as much as 98% is the first one. Um, the second one is, as we say, uh, hybrid working. Of course, we understand face-to-face -face interaction have the value. But if you have the right hybrid working to allow your employees to work anytime, anywhere, basically, um, you can also give flexibility for your employee. Then certain level of remote working not only can help your employee to have more flexibility, help you to retain the talent, at the same time, can have contributions on the sustainability areas as well. And last, of course, 
if every company will have your office, then um, smart building is something that they can consider. And of course, for the property developer, uh, be honest with you, we also receive a lot of um, inquiry. And in, indeed, for Ever, we do also have some collaboration. How we can help developer to build their uh, smart buildings? I think this is some of the things we are working uh, in the industry to help the industry the journey of sustainability. But of course, there's some more things, but maybe I save the time for some other speaker first, then see any chance I can share more besides the CSR, what we are doing in the communities to help these areas. Yeah. Yes. yes. Your turn, because I already talk yeah. a lot. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thank you. And I will continue. Yes, I'm representing Siemens, a uh, German technology company. And we are committed, in fact, to drive um, net zero transformation with digital technologies, what we also call digital transformation. I will come back to this a bit later and also like to share with you our own commitments. 2015, many, many years ago, Siemens set the target to become carbon neutral in 2030. So, and we are quite good on the way. And we have already achieved around 46% CO2 reduction in 2022 based on, the, on our, our numbers in 2019. And we have already set a very comprehensive sustainable to framework, what we call degree framework, again, to drive all those sustainable to activities, respectively ESG activities in our company. Happy to share later on more in details. I try to move on on this. Again, 2030, we will become carbon neutral. Of course, scope one and two. Scope three, which is more tough because we are, uh, well, a technology company also manufacturing a lot of technology devices uh, done in manufacturing sites, which of course consume uh, a lot of energy which needs to be considered and also use a lot of suppliers. So again, scope one, two will become carbon neutral in 2030. Scope three, 20% reduction by 2030. Of course, 100% reduction by 2050. So that is our commitment which we set and we are working heavily on this to achieve it. I have a couple of examples happy to share later on if you are interested. Another important aspect, if you talk about, again, ESG, as I said, degree, our sustainability framework, the D is for decarbonization, our commitment to support the goal achieving 1.0 degree warming uh, globally. That is something which we are working on. The R in the degree is related to the resource optimization. Also here, we have committed to reduce our waste to landfill. By 2025, 50% by 20. 30, 100% reduction of our waste to landfill. Of course, through recycling, through other optimizations of our manufacturing and others are our goals to, again, uh, reduce our waste to landfill. Now, move to the other side. For us, the sustainability topic, becoming, again, carbon neutral, is very much linked to technologies. And here we are talking about digital technologies. Uh, Kelly has nicely explained what you are doing at Microsoft. We are doing on the industrial side. We are set providing solutions to our customers in different verticals, be it in the manufacturing sector, but be it also in the infrastructure sector. And the infrastructure is a bit more complex, be it energy management in cities, grid management, for example, building management, those are areas we're focusing on and assisting our customers to drive their own initiatives to become carbon neutral through digital technologies. Digital technologies are a very broad term. I try to well, address one or key, uh, two key uh, concepts which we are uh, deploying. We are talking about digital tools which can help us to design our products in a much, much more efficient way. We're also talking about digital twins, software models of the products. Through digital twins, I can optimize my product design. 
through simulation tools, I can, I can test before I manufacture and optimize during the design phase. I can use digital technologies to, to, to test my production. We're also talking about production twin. So that means in manufacturing side, it's very important how the production is run. We, have providing, we are providing tools to our customers which they can utilize to build digital twin of their production. Not only product, but also production. And then later on, after having the product which is running, I can also use the performance twin of a product to, well, analyze its behavior of a product, its energy consumption, or it is, well, product, uh, component co uh, consumption in, in, in different areas. And that I can also optimize, again, through digital tools, using AI tools, AI analytics, and reduce the energy consumption of a product using the digital twin or performance twin of the product. So that is just an example to share with you what we do. The same we do with the buildings, by the way. We have Ecodomus, is a software uh, company which we have acquired, providing tools to build digital twin of the buildings. With this, I can simulate in my building also its energy consumption and optimize before I build my building, for example. Or during its life cycle, I can utilize the digital twin also to maintain the facility management of my building. So that's another example which, which we are, uh, I have to say, it, utilizing in buildings. I can build digital twin of a smart grid. With this, I can manage this operation, and with this, I can also use it for my planning for the expansion of my smart grid. Today, we know a lot of renewable energies are coming into the grid, which makes the grid operations much more complex. And this, I can also optimize using digital uh, tools and digital trends. So, just to share with you, as I said, sustainability is very much linked to digital technologies, and with digital technologies, I can optimize the operations of my products, of the buildings, of the grids, and with this, help to reduce CO2 emissions, and with this, of course, helping not only us to become carbon neutral, but also our customers to become carbon neutral. Of course, we are also cooperating with different companies, especially proud to cooperate with Microsoft and integrating Microsoft uh, tools like ChatGPT into our team center, which we are providing to, 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 to product designer and production designer, which they can also help to design their products in a much better way. So that will be the next phase of improvement of product design using AI tools and, of course, with our cooperation with Microsoft. I think enough. Uh, I'm happy to go into other examples and share with you what we'll do maybe in the next round. Thank you. That's okay. Thanks. Uh, indeed, I think uh, it's glad to see from, from Microsoft and Siemens so many different kind of technology that is in support of the green uh, tech development. I think if you look back for the past two years, we have so many different kind of technology development uh, uh, for the two years. I was just thinking while we were listening to you too, that if let's say I went to a Caribbean island and spend time there without any connection to the world and the internet, and then I come back after two years, there are a lot of terms that I don't know what you're talking about. Imagine what is Metaverse, what is ChatGPT. I think two years ago, we didn't know. So technology advanced very quickly, and it's indeed happy to see that you have so many different technology development there. Now, we have talked about technology just now. We also talked about the government support. These are very important aspects. But for Hong Kong, what do you think is the bottleneck of our development? Land land use. And it's indeed, uh, we are very excited just now from Vincent's presentation. We have so many hectares, I've forgotten already how many hectares of land. How many? 88. 88 hectares, a lot of land in Hong Kong. And then it's how many times the science park size? Four times in terms of land. Yeah, four times. So science park already, I think, is very big. So it's good that we have such a big piece of land to attract overseas companies to set up uh, our, uh, their companies or their presence in Hong Kong, and also bring in the technology like the green tech and also support that they have. Now, one thing I would like to ask Vincent is that in order to achieve the initiative mentioned in your presentation just now, you would need to have a lot of partners. 
and what kind of partners you are looking for, that you know, what kind of support that you will give them and what kind of support that you expect them to give you. Okay, I think from, from a partner's perspective, thank you, Lawrence. Uh, Lawrence uh, there, I think there are four types of partners. Uh, originally, it's three, but when I talk to Simon, I think I will have to say four uh, today. The first type of partners, obviously, is partners with technologies, proven technologies that can help us to build a part today. Then, please come in. Say, for example, utility companies. If you have new ideas about energy, introduced to us, help us to build a park with most efficient use of energies. Um, secondly, is of course, because we are an INT center, of course we need all the local institutions, universities, all the R&D institutions, that you have new ideas, new technologies, that may be not mature enough yet, but I think there are a lot, maybe a lot of potential. I think the park is a perfect place for you as a test bed for your technologies. And we are very happy to help you to set up your R&D here or in our park, and then give you all the support, no matter it's incentives, land, or other things, and then give you a potential test bed to test your, te uh, to test your technologies. I think I call for all of the R&D communities to come to support this with our common mission really is to create the technologies and to make it work, commercialize, and then also deploy it in Prague and also other parts of the world. The third, which I nearly add is, I just talked to uh, this chat with Simon uh, during the break. I understand that there are a lot of embassies, trade organizations overseas present in this conference. I would also like to call for your support as our partners to help us to bring in your Best of breed, top talents, top R&D institutions on these areas to come to Hong Kong, to the loop, to set up their new dreamland in terms of R&D, and then there will be plenty of opportunities, test bed, potential, markets, and there will be a lot of talents, not just their own talents, but a lot of talents from other parts of the world, from different parts of the, uh, of the industries to, to work together to create ideas and then to test your ideas. So I call for the, all of the support for all the presence of all the embassies, trade organizations from overseas. You come to help us to bring in your, your R&D companies and that's the dreamland for them. That will be a dreamland for them, I can promise you. The fourth one is data. I think the part, we are going to build a, um, a digital platform, open digital platform. We are going, the part itself will generate a lot of data when we work with uh, private uh, partners, uh, when they build their assets in our land, they will also give us the data. We also invite all the partners who have data to come in to use the data in your R&D. Share the data, use the data. You drive the digital ecosystem, drive the digital uh, economy. I think that's the fourth partners I would like to see or I would like to call for you guys to consider us. Thank you. Thank you. So I think we will have some time for some questions from the floor. Would any of you like to ask our, don't ask me, ask our speakers. Uh, some questions that you would like to, to know more. Yes, yes, sir. Hello, um, David Clark from uh, Evernoon, Shangri. Um, in Hong Kong. Uh, we're one of those uh, small UK businesses that has uh, been helped by uh, Invest Hong Kong to uh, establish here. Uh, and we're working on AI technologies and we are using the generative AI and we're working very closely with Microsoft and our universities in the UK. Um, I, I begin by saying thank you for inviting us and thank you for the enormous support collaboration we've had over recent months as looking at Hong Kong as a place to invest. The welcome has been tremendous here in the UK. Uh, the question I have, I suppose, really is around probably, uh, <laughs> probably on the Microsoft side, very refreshing what you're saying. We're seeing this with our technologies. We're working on multilingual technologies, predominantly around safety applications, how we structure and prepare data. The work you've done with, uh, you know, with OpenAI, with GPT 3.5 now and into 4, 
tremendous. It's allowing us to do amazing things with, with businesses. I suppose a question for you in, in a sense is, I think a little bit of the elephant in the room is how we bring along the community. We're working very much on safety and well-being. These are things that we can use it for good. What would you say from, from Microsoft's side, what would you encourage us all to do to, en to encourage people to come on this journey with us? It's all right us doing this stuff and working in collaboration, but we must bring the people along. They help to reduce waste. They help to report risks and come up with great ideas. Uh, what are you seeing at Microsoft? What would you encourage all of us to do to, uh, to improve uh, that understanding and join the journey? Thanks for the question, you know. Um, indeed, um, what I want to say in case I have chances, then what are the gaps uh, right now in this topic? As I said earlier, um, ESG is a big thing on the investment field. Then I feel indeed for those big companies, we already see the momentum. But where is the gap? The gap is um, some small company SME or maybe some individual still feel that wow, well, it's a topic very distant from them because they get an impression that Ah, it's a topic so expensive, they cannot afford it, it's not relevant for them. If you ask me, sustainability, green economy is a topic so relevant for everyone, no matter big company or small company, or no matter it's a professional individual. But how they can participate, I think for small company, as I said, nowadays, if you, because technology is highly relevant to a company's futures, and if you need to use AI, need to move to the cloud, then move to the cloud indeed. For SMB, it will make your life even more easier. You don't need to hold your computer under your table, all this kind of thing. Immediately, can you, 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 you can have some carbon re reduction, move to the cloud. The second thing is partnership. Let me share you with you one example. Uh, recently, uh, indeed, I just posted in my LinkedIn uh, a story about Food Angel. Um, Food Angel is a non-profit making organization. One of their mission is how they, because in, 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 in the community, you know, there's still some underprivileged people. They face a lot of challenge. They cannot have sufficient food. But at the same time, we all understand that every day, you know, uh, in some part of the community, there's a lot of wastage because they cannot sell out the food. Then what we are doing is, uh, basically, we um, connect different stakeholders. One stakeholder is the stakeholder, every day, maybe like supermarket or maybe a hotel, they, at the end of the day, because the food cannot use, they either give it to the people who need it, otherwise they will just fall away. And on the other hand, is to connect the community, a different charity organization, they will provide food for those underprivileged people. Then what we are doing is, we create a cloud platform by using the power of AI, our dynamic solutions, to have real-time co collections of the data to understand what is the possible ways of food, we connect with different partners, like Cafe Pacific, Peninsula Hotel, uh, Park and Shop, then we can collect those um, close to expiry food or food they will fall away if not used. And on the other hand, we have a central, uh, food angel have a central kitchen, so that the people will, according to the availability of different kinds of food, and design the menu, and then we also provide a logistics system um, and so as to coordinate different um, uh, the transportation with the right size uh, transport the food to the people who need it. Then with this arrangement, you know, basically, um, in order to provide the food, 60% of the ingredients are come from those food ingredients are going will fall away. Then that means food angel only need to buy 40% of the food. With this arrangement, most are learning. By use power of technology and connect with different stakeholders in the community. That's what we mean by partnership. What we can achieve, you can reduce wastage, 
we can also balance the resources for different parts of the world and at the same time to drive a more inclusive economy. Then with this example, the key message is we leverage the latest technology, cloud technology and partnership of different stakeholders to make the thing happen. Then that means everybody can contribute. Thank you very much. We have time for one very quick question and one very quick answer. <laughs> <laughs> yes, do we have any one more? Yes, lady in the middle. Uh, Cynthia Zhu from Sinus Synergy International. Uh, we are a company that specializes in hydrogen fuel cell technology and providing hydrogen-related solutions. And uh, I, I, I know uh, the question needs to be quick, <laughs> so I just also want to make a very quick comment. Uh, so thanks so much for Invest Hong Kong. Uh, I think we are one of the examples uh, that has been benefited a lot uh, from what policy, the policy that Andy introduced earlier. And uh, uh, so here's a question. The question is to Mr. Ma. Uh, very exciting to learn a lot about um, the, the new science park uh, going forward. Uh, you mentioned about that you're also going to launch a public and a private partnership. And I mean, I know the answer will be quick as well. <laughs> so so, so if, uh, if you can collaborate a bit more about you know, the framework or uh, maybe a little bit detail uh, about that partnership, what that would be like and can you know, direct us to uh, maybe a source of data or website, then <laughs> we can look for more information about it. Thanks very much. OK, thank you. Thank you for the, for the question. So I, I only have a very quick answer. Now, uh, we are considering this private partnership, uh, uh, private public partnership model. Now, that's the reason why we're actually doing a lot of uh, work in terms of uh, consultancy support. Arab is one of the consultancy that we are helping us. Basically, we are now trying to f create the framework of that model. Um, so we don't have a lot of details at this point to, uh, to publicly announce, to be honest. But on the other hand, I think I uh, welcome any offline discussions uh, to, to share with you a little bit more. But in general, we are going to divide the land in our batch two and batch three into land parcels. And then each of the land, and, 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 and in, the, in, the, in the layout, we'll have, we are going to cluster it into multiple major pillar industries, say, for example, life science, new energy, new materials, and then, uh, and, or higher education. There will be different set, uh, clusters that will be put, um, 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 define the land. And then we will try to divide the land into parcels, and then towards the end of the year, we will try to invite uh, interested enterprise to, to come to either um, uh, work on the work on the uh, commercial arrangement or we may consider tendering we haven't designed all this yet but um, but that's um, but that's going to happen towards the end of the year and in the meantime more and more details will be developed so uh, we, we welcome some online, offline discussion at this point I cannot publicly announce a lot of things at this point unfortunately Yes, uh, probably supplement that in terms of hydrogen and new energy de development, our own council actually would be working on that. So we will probably exchange the name card afterwards. Yes, <laughs> thank you. So with that, thank you all uh, for coming. I think uh, I think our time is up. Uh, we are over one one minute forty seconds. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. I'll pass the time back to the MC. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the panel chair and all the panelists for the inspiring and interactive discussion. Please come forward to take a group photo together. Also invite our honorable guests and speakers to the stage for another group photo. Dr. Andy Lee of Arab, Mr. Andy Wong of Invest Hong Kong, 
Ms. Jenny Lee of Hong Kong Green Finance Association, Dr. Vincent Zhang of Arab, Mr. Norman Zhang of Veolia, Hong Kong, Ms. Carmen Zhang of Credit Agricole CIB, Mr. Yuan Chi Wei of Carbo Infrastructure, Mr. Simon. Oh, Mr. Simon of uh, Mr. Simon. Mr. Simon, mm, our BEC CEO. Thank you, guests. Please take your seats. Ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of our summit. I hope you find it informative and fruitful. We would like to express our gratitude to all our speakers for sharing your expertise with us. Please join me in giving a final round of applause. <laughs> for the guests who are invited to join the lunch room, lunch will be served shortly in the next ballroom. Please make sure to bring your personal belongings with you. For the rest of the guests here and those who join us online, thank you very much for your support and participation. May I wish you all have a lovely afternoon. Thank you.